Trujillo had spent the past two summers guiding canoe trips in the Lake of the Woods in Minnesota. And his claim is that he had a few run-ins and heard many stories from other guides about their strange experiences. Beings that had lived in this area for thousands of years and there were many places they couldn't camp on because they were Indian reservations. Now, Theo had heard this area specifically referred to as Wendigo country and there were actually multiple places named after it, like the Wendigo Isles, for example. Now, Theo also had plenty of stories that had been passed on by other guides which were pretty terrifying. And the one he was willing to share was probably the most terrifying of all. It was him, another guide, and they had about seven kids with them on this one particular trip. Now, on the first night, they would stop after a long day of paddling at a campsite known specifically as Little Trisket. They had one camper with them that was somewhere on the autism spectrum and due to this he had significant communication issues as they were making dinner over the fire that evening this particular camper seemed to notice something in the woods behind the group and he kept saying things along the lines of who's that man in the woods and he would describe this man as tall very skinny and very pale white like a like an ashen ghostly white now, of course, Theo and the other guides just try to assure him that there was no one there, it was impossible, and they even did a head count to reassure him and make sure that everybody was there. And of course, humoring him, they would check it out and they didn't see anything, they didn't notice anybody there, they just calmly brushed it off and went back to making dinner. But ladies and gentlemen, that same night, a different camper in her tent by herself, because she was the only girl on the trip, she also experienced something strange. As Theo and his co-guide were beginning to fall asleep, now at one point or another, they heard her start screaming and then stop. And because it stopped, they decided to brush it off and figured maybe she had night terrors, something was going on, but whatever it could probably wait until morning. So the following morning, they had asked her what was up. And she had said that something was shaking her tent and she thought it was them. Well, it wasn't. And so one day, the boys were all in their tents and the girl was in her tent. And then when they took her tent down, they took the stakes out and two of them were apparently completely bent at a 90 degree angle. And so they're confused that this is even possible. And so they're messing around with it. They're testing the flexibility and they couldn't get these stakes to go back and budge at all. Now, Theo had been in some crazy wind storms out here, probably around 40 miles an hour, but he had never seen a stake bent like that. And so they left Little Trisket and all the weird stuff apparently stopped happening. Apparently they had an awesome trip afterward, but when they got back to base camp, Theo talked to another guy that had stayed at the same campsite the night after him. And Theo didn't say anything. He didn't encourage this conversation at all. She just outright told him that there was apparently some sort of large white creature at that particular campsite. And she would go on to tell Theo that as she was going to the bathroom way back in the woods and thought that another camper had accidentally come to her bathroom spot and ran away. And so confused by this, she goes back, but everybody was there fully accounted for. Nobody had even left the fire in the time that she had left. And of course, there were much scarier stories and experiences that other guides had also had who had been involved with this specific area. Now, Theo's claim is that there are easily hundreds of stories that are just like his and these other guides that go back hundreds of years from many, many natives in the area. Another eyewitness of the name of Bobby also shared his story. Now, ever since Bobby could remember when he was very little, he would loved hunting squirrels and deer, and it began as an innocent bonding experience, something that him and his father would do together every fall. But after his father had perished, Bobby couldn't help but find himself out there more and more. I mean, it was his father's favorite thing to do, and so Bobby was just lucky enough to be a part of it with him, and going out there and doing it was a firm reminder that his dad was still with him. Maybe not in flesh, ladies and gentlemen, 
but spirit. Now, after the following experience, though, Bobby was scared to head back to the woods. So let me lay the groundwork for you guys. It was a snowy Saturday morning, and looking back, the sun had just come up. And that particular day, Bobby had been hunting squirrels, but the woods were deathly quiet and still. So Bobby was sitting there under the old dead oak tree, and he was just soaking up every bit of beauty he possibly could, enjoying the peace and quiet. Now, everything was suddenly stirred to life by what he described was a gruff grunting sound. Now, the noise was similar to a buck call at first, but it was so much lower and more visceral and guttural. Now, at first, Bobby thought a massive buck was dying out in the snow, but then it came again, but close enough to make his blood run cold. Whatever it was, it was not dying. It had moved at an impossible amount of distance within only a few seconds. Bobby honestly had no idea what it was he was hearing, and he did the only thing he could do. He sat still and tried his best not to breathe. Now, only a few moments later, he saw something that changed his life in the worst way possible. The head of what he described as a deer with a sickly look and eyes with way too much white appeared out from behind a tree, roughly no more than 15 yards in front of him. He described it as motionless, and worst of all, the darn thing was nine feet off the ground. Bobby had never seen any deer that tall. This thing looked like it had just been in a fight while fighting off a deadly virus. It was not a pretty sight to see. Now, a clawed hand appeared just below it, and Bobby instantly knew this was something from the demonic realm. It sounded like something out of a children's book of scary stories, and he wished that it could have all been untrue. But here he was, face to face with this thing. But here, ladies and gentlemen, were what he described as these dark, disgusting black nails sliding along the bark, and the way its head was angled, it was as if it was staring and boring its eyes into his very soul. Instinct eventually took over, Bobby grabs his gun, and he runs as quickly as possible back to his truck. He had never ran so fast before in his life, but somehow he still heard this thing coming behind him, and he could hear it grunting and moving, and he could hear it inching closer, although he couldn't hear it running. It was as if it emitted no sound. Finally, Bobby reaches his truck, slams the door shut, starts it, floors the thing, but before he really took off, Bobby made one grave mistake. Now, with the way that Bobby described it, it was as if it had been copied and pasted that that thing's decaying head and clawed hand were now protruding from a pine tree at the forest edge. And Bobby learned something that day as much as he loves hunting because he grew up with it with his father and it reminds him of his father. He doesn't know if he'll ever be going back to that section of forest ever again. In the early 1970s, police in Lawton, Oklahoma would receive a series of chilling phone calls from terrified residents of something stalking their town. What I'll share with you in today's video that police reported on will make you think twice about ever setting foot in this Oklahoma town. In the late winter of 1971, a Donald child reportedly saw something that would chill him to the bone. Donald was a resident of Lawton, Oklahoma, a relatively calm and peaceful town, but he had no idea that he would come face to face with the stuff of nightmares and Hollywood horror movies. One evening, as he was sitting at home, he spotted something to the very front window of his house. He described it to the police as a monstrous creature and actually went into cardiac arrest on the spot. By most, he was considered a young man. He was only a little older than me in his mid-30s. 
Now, it was later reported by the authorities that whatever this animal was had attempted to drink out of this small fish pond. However, the pond was empty and it soon left disinterested. Fortunately for Donald, he survived but was kept in the hospital in a continuous state of terror after what he saw. But folks, the story gets hairier. The media soon had a frenzy about this and everything referred to this creature as a werewolf judging by his descriptions. He was interviewed by a police officer named Clancy Williams. Donald described the creature very strangely. Get this, he claimed it was tall with lots of hair all over its face and dressed in a very indescribable manner, to quote him verbatim. He would later explain that it was apparently wearing pants that were far too small for it. This, however, was not an isolated incident. Other eyewitnesses of the same evening came forward and they claimed they saw the same creature bounding the streets and attempting to dodge vehicles. The most terrifying aspect is that it would switch between four legs and two. Boom! Not even 30 minutes after Donald's initial encounter, a police officer named Harry Azell had to calm down one hysterical eyewitness. Now, Officer Azell claimed that an eyewitness had opened the window curtain at roughly 11.15 p.m., and this was when the eyewitness speculated that some sort of practical joke was being played on them because there was a sizable wolf-like creature perched on the railing. However, the eyewitness described it as more of a monkey or ape. Thinking it was a prop or a joke, it turned its head and looked right at the eyewitness, followed by jumping down to the ground, which was around 17 feet. Now, the eyewitness described its face as being horribly distorted, misfigured, akin to being in a fire, and hair all over its face, upper body, and the lower parts of its body. Next, ladies and gentlemen, we find out that the military actually got involved. Now, apparently, a group of soldiers from Fort Still had encountered this same creature roughly 15 minutes later. These were trained soldiers, and even they were terrified. The sightings occurred roughly on Friday and Saturday night. Now, what's crazy is that even though the Sunday following was relatively quiet, the police quickly acted. On that Monday, not even a total of 48 hours after the sightings, a Major Clarence Hill, the current commander of the police patrol division at the time, sent out a widespread alert carefully ordering all of his men to be on watch for, and I quote, the wolf man. Clearly, there had been enough eyewitness accounts that were not thoroughly documented that caused such a stir in this town. Strangely, the descriptions are not entirely what people would call a dog man. Some just believe this to be a mistaken Bigfoot sighting. However, an overwhelming amount of eyewitness descriptions point to a large bipedal wolf. The strangest part, of course, was apparently the pants on this creature that Donald saw, which would make us think that it was a shapeshifter of some kind. Understandably, anyone remotely skeptical would listen to this and think of something of a werewolf and just how absurd it all is. But make no mistake about it, folks, Oklahoma is home to many other dogman eyewitness accounts. Back about 20 years ago, when I was visiting Kentucky, because that's where my dad used to live, I saw something that most people don't believe exists. I call it a werewolf. I've heard other names for it, but I really don't know what else to name it. Back in 2001, I was trying to find my dad's house for the first time since he moved there, and I was using a map to try and find what road to take. I can't remember what two-lane highway I was using, but I remember turning off into a pullout to put my car in park and study the map. As I'm looking down at the map, trying to find the right road to take, I get this overwhelming sensation that somebody's looking at me. I look up and look to my left onto the road and there's nobody, no cars, nothing. Then I look to my right and standing not even 10 feet away from my vehicle is a living werewolf in the flash, or at least that's how I would describe it. This thing had to be 9 to 10 feet tall easily and was more solid than somebody who bench presses 200 pounds. This thing was a behemoth with a head that resembled someone of a Doberman pincher with sharp pointed ears and a wider shorter snout. This thing was covered in jet black hair but was not long and shaggy. It was more short and coarse 
worse because I could vividly remember seeing the muscle ripples through its fur. It was glaring at me, looking right into my eyes menacingly. It seemed pissed off that I pulled into that pullout and saw it. I don't know if I encroach on its territory or what I did, but I got the strong feeling that it did not want me around. I'm staring at this animal in total shock. It's like I was in some sort of trance looking into its evil yellow eyes. After what felt like 10 seconds, I was able to snap out of it, and I put that car into drive, and I whipped out of there so fast. I was probably doing 65 to 70 miles per hour when that highway is only about 45. In fact, a man by the name of David had actually encountered another man at a local fair who had reluctantly shared one of the most disturbing and strangest incidents from this gentleman's past. David refers to this man as Clark to disguise his real name. Now, this individual who he began speaking to is actually a notable public figure in that particular community and only ever agreed to share the story if his name would be changed. Now, years back to what David believes to be the 1980s, Clark was hunting deer near the woods of his home. He enjoyed hunting like many other folks who live in rural communities and really enjoy that lifestyle. Since he had already established a deer stand, the evening quickly set in and the sun was setting in the sky. Clark's plan was simple. Wait patiently in the deer stand until the first sign of a potential kill. Now, this was near Dirks Road towards the deep woods. The location of this deer stand is roughly a mile away from his property. As he's sitting up in his stand, he begins to hear something, rustling of some kind, something very large that he thought would be a very large buck. However, he noticed that whatever this was was not trying to be quiet and was audibly very large, judging by how quick and noisy it was. Now, this figure he describes leapt out from a tree right down into a clearing in front of the stand. Remembering that this clearing is directly in front of the stand and is roughly about 50 by 80 feet, give or take, you know, a rather small meadow. Clark was in complete fear because standing not even 50 feet away from him was a massive animal, something he would describe as an amalgamation of man and wolf. He claimed that this was towering and massive and easily eight feet tall, if not larger. He described it as similar to a grizzly bear in size and stature. Its head, shoulders, and chest were incredibly massive, and it was pitch black in color. He then went on to describe the ears, that they were long and sharp, and rippling muscles could be seen underneath its unkempt fur. The hands he described were very much like that of a human's, five digits with long three to four inch black claws at the end of each. Its legs also had hawks, just like a dog. Now, this thing stood there for a few seconds before it began moving and froze mid-stride. And that's when it slowly tilted its head and turned towards his direction and began to sniff. It was here that Clark described urinating on himself out of complete terror. What he described next was nothing short of scary. He swears by this, and keep in mind the entire time he's keeping an eye on this thing through this little peephole in the stand. And he claims that this thing smirked at him and believes that it smelt him. It then turned its head back in the original direction it was planning on going, leapt up into another tree, and it was gone. Fearing that his life was now in danger, Clark decided to wait about 15, 20 minutes, give or take, before very slowly and quietly exiting the tree stand to which his gut instincts were screaming at him to leave. He describes that the entire woodlands around him were so quiet, you could hear his heart beating from a mile away. It was extremely unnerving. Now, unfortunately, this thing went in the same direction he had to take back to go to his own property, which was roughly a mile or so away. So what does Clark do? He starts going back in the direction of where he lived and made haste as best as he could. I mean, what is the guy supposed to do, wait it out? Now, he wasn't even out of this tiny meadow for more than a couple of moments before he begins hearing sounds similar to what he had heard when he was up in the tree stand. Unfortunately, this time it wasn't just one large animal, several. Now, he would stop multiple times and just try to gauge his surroundings, thinking he was about to be flanked. 
What was even worse is that judging from where the noise was coming from, he was being followed and surrounded by multiples of these things. They could not have been more than 20 to 30 feet away from him given by the noise and how close they were. And what scared Clark greatly was that this was in November. So most of all the thick foliage and plants from everything was in the process of falling to the ground or had already depleted from the plants. Now this meant that visibility should have allowed him to see what his potential assailants were, but he couldn't see anything. But he could certainly hear them. He almost described it as if they were somehow cloaked because they were completely invisible to the human eye. Now, he just keeps going, and about at the halfway point where his stand was, in the back portion of where he would go onto Clark's property, was a small river. Now, this river actually runs parallel with the path, and it was right here where Clark described that a deer was tossed onto the path. A literal half-eaten deer, and I don't mean a deer that had been eaten on, I'm talking literally half the deer from about the chest up, including its front legs, where that was all that was left of it. He described it as if it had been torn apart and ripped in half, not eaten on and thrown there, but torn in half, and that there was just so much blood and carnage, and it looked gnarly. At this point, Clark is very much fearing for his safety. He was not going to stand there and take time to observe the remains of this deer, and it spooked him because he realized whatever these creatures were, they were now toying with him. He had not been out of his stand for more than two hours at most, and that deer was not there on the path before. It was conveniently placed right in the middle of his path, and he had no choice but to actually step around it to keep going. Now, he also mentioned something that I find very interesting. He would tell David that he kept getting these nasty whiffs of what he would describe as wet dog, urine, and rotting meat. It was a smell that would just come and go, but he described it as very heavy and pungent. You know how when it's summertime and it's really hot out, and if there's an odor, you can smell it really strong? Well, he described the odor as having that same intensity despite the cold weather. Now, once he made it back safely, he completely abandoned ever going back to that particular deer stand he had set up years ago, and, well, he's never been back since, according to him. Now, he was convinced he was dealing with some unknown alpha predator that could trump bear, coyotes, or wolves. Now, he told David that he has far more respect for what the woods hold and is very selective about where he hunts, if at all anymore. Now, the following year, he had apparently told a close family friend about his experience from that fall. They, too, would tell Clark about their own experiences while living up in the state of Michigan and later Wisconsin back in the 1980s, and that these sightings and experiences would continue with this family friend even after moving down to Oklahoma. Now, this is when Clark learns that they were actually referred to as Dogman, and his family friend's descriptions were nearly identical to what Clark saw, which was a large, black, muscular, bipedal wolf with sharp features and yellow eyes. Now, it's important to note that there appears to be a plethora of Dogman accounts in Oklahoma. Still, it is not exclusive to that state. In fact, many other areas, even outside the continental United States, also have horrific encounters with similar creatures, specifically the South and even down to Mexico. Like this story, for example. A man named Jonathan recounted a chilling tale of an apparent dogman attack in Mexico as reported on the website Beyond Creepy. Jonathan said that the incident involved his uncle driving a cargo truck through a remote jungle area at night. Now, as they navigated the rough, unpaved road, something large and heavy reportedly leaped into the back of their truck. Now, his uncles didn't halt to investigate what it was just due to the absence of any light on the road, but the uncle on the passenger side spotted a devilish creature resembling a dog advancing towards the truck's cabin. They described the creature as enormous. Fear then gripped them, and they screamed as they saw it, attempting to shake the truck in hopes of dislodging this thing. However, it did not fall off until they collided with the tree on the opposite side of the road. 
they still continue driving, their nerves frayed from night until morning. And upon reaching a gas station in a village, they discovered gash marks and animal-like handprints on the windows where the creature had tried to gain entry and on the back trailer. So they relayed their story to some villagers and farmers who informed them that this dogman-like demon creature were known to roam those particular areas. They were also told that they were not the only ones who had been attacked and that the fear was so intense that even as they told their experience, the hair on their arms stood on end. They vowed to never drive through Central America at night unless they were within the confines of any city or village. Now, Jonathan wished he had recounted their accounts because his uncles have since passed away, but they maintained the veracity of their story until their last dying breath, and Jonathan confirmed they were not drug users. What's really interesting to me about that particular story is that these aren't just some creepy pastas you find online. That particular story is in an area where it's just so rural, and these people are just farmers trying to just survive, and to them, that's normal, right? They have other accounts accounts of these kinds of things happening in and around their country. So to them, it's just something else they have to deal with. Another Latino man, Tony Martinez, had ran a small taco truck on the outskirts of a small Spanish town set up in what used to be an old parking lot. Lately, he had been pouring a significant portion of his profits into repairs due to these large dents and scratches mysteriously appearing on his truck overnight. His operations would shut down in the evening with his two-man crew cleaning up and heading home by around 8.30. Now, for a while, Tony had no surveillance equipment and began noticing deep scratch marks on his truck. Now, this didn't happen every night, but it was often enough to cause concern. Other times, they would arrive in the morning to find huge dents on the side. Now, the location of Tony's taco truck was somewhat isolated on the edge of a larger village with not much else in the area. However, they managed to attract decent foot traffic and beyond them was a undeveloped plot of land with wilderness beyond. And so Tony initially thought they were attracting critters because his employees weren't properly disposing of daily waste and food products. However, once he installed a surveillance system, he would quickly discover that this was not the case. What Tony claims he saw on the surveillance footage both scared and baffled him. He would see a canine figure approach the truck and attack it. Now, this creature would walk around the truck and sporadically attack the side of it, clawing and biting. In fact, there were moments when the creature would charge the truck from off camera and slam into it. And Tony even remembered watching the footage for the first time thinking, what is this? He even had some of his employees watch it to confirm that he wasn't crazy and they were seeing the same thing. Now, Tony didn't know what this thing was or why it was attacking his truck, but it was costing him a lot of money. He ended up having to move his truck far away from that location. He couldn't stress enough that this thing was large and he claimed it walked on two legs. He didn't know of any animal that did this, but this one did. Now, since moving to the new location, he has not apparently had any issues but he kept a 12 gauge shotgun ready in case this thing decided to attack his truck. Now afterward, he gave the footage to authorities to help him identify the culprit of the attack, but was strictly advised not to show the footage to anyone and the footage was then confiscated. As of 2019, he left the business shortly after these events. What truly attacked his vehicle is a mystery. But folks, it gets even worse if you live in the South. A man named Roger lived near the Arkansas River and had several encounters with what he believed to be the dog man. For those that are unfamiliar, this large black dog could be deadly if one wasn't careful. Roger had to keep his animals in at night for fear of being mauled. Now he used to have four dogs, but one was slaughtered by this creature supposedly. The dog was a bloodhound, a pet he loved dearly. He had named him Brave, having raised him from a puppy. Now, one evening as Roger was returning home from work, he just saw Brave lying in his back field, beaten and bloody. Now, when he ran over to him, the dog was covered in blood from head to toe with deep six inch lacerations all over its body. And they were in patterns of four and five as if he had been clawed violently by some large animal. It looked like one of the lacerations had nicked an artery in Brave's neck because he was bleeding out and was almost gone. His left eye was also missing and he looked swollen with broken bones. 
Roger, of course, began sobbing uncontrollably, clueless about what could have done this to his beloved dog. His first thought was bear, but he hadn't seen a bear around there and wasn't aware of bears behaving in such a violent manner. Now, it wasn't long after that that Roger found other mutilated animals around and near his property. Deer were pretty common to find ripped up, but sometimes he would find raccoons, possums, and even skunks, as he described, all shredded into ribbons. He had no idea what was out there killing these small animals and leaving them, but it seemed like these animals were being killed for the sake of being killed. Just recently, Roger had started hearing about a lot of screaming out by the river at around nine in the evening. Now, it didn't sound like a human being, but rather like an animal, like something was guttural. Now, he was too cautious and scared to risk going out and to see what it was, but the way his property was situated, if you exited through the back screen door and walked out a little ways, say about 100 to 200 yards, the land would start to go downhill towards a creek. Now, this screaming sounded like it was coming down by the creek. Whatever was making it had to have been very large and very loud. Now, instinctively, Roger wanted to say it was a mountain lion because that was the only rational scientific explanation that came to his mind, but it didn't quite sound like a mountain lion. It was different. Roger wouldn't even dare step foot further than he needed to on his property without carrying a high caliber rifle for his life. He had seen this thing a few times after and trusted it less than he trusted lawyers, to quote him. This thing had been terrorizing him for long enough and he wouldn't hesitate to put a bullet into this thing. For those who had dealt with similar experiences, Roger was sure they would agree that this thing was easier to hear than it was to see. Now, he had only ever seen it a handful of times, but he had heard it way more often than he would have liked. It was almost as if it wanted him to know it was in the area, but didn't want him to see it. This next account was from a man named Bob when he was only 12 years old, and the incident I'm about to tell you occurred. He remembers it very vividly. He had woken up in the middle of the night to quench his thirst and had done so. Then he thought he needed to use the bathroom. Afterward, he crawled back into bed, but couldn't quite get comfortable. And you know how it is when you're tired and you're trying to toss and turn. Now, suddenly, the motion light detector outside his window turns on. Now, his bedroom was near the front door, so whenever the motion light detector was triggered, he could see if somebody was standing outside their door from his position in bed. The light was bright enough that even though with his eyes closed, he noticed a change in the lighting. And just out of reflex, he opens his eyes and he looked. Pressing its face against the glass was the ugliest dog face he had ever seen. Now, after a second or two of staring in horror at this animal, it dragged its face left to right, smearing saliva and mucus against the glass while never breaking eye contact with him. It had huge pointed ears and a snout reminding him of a German Shepherd. However, it was much uglier than a German Shepherd. Bob remembered his aunt's German Shepherd, which he loved dearly. Now, as the creature dragged its face against the glass, Bob was screaming, being a 12-year-old, and unsure what to do. He could tell it was almost getting off to his terror. It began to smirk at him, and he had never been stared at so intently by anyone or anything before. It was wicked, as he described. And the next thing he knew, he was running out of his bedroom in a state of sheer panic, so enveloped in fear that he didn't even remember jumping out of the bed. He only ever saw that thing once, and it wasn't like they lived anywhere unusual or rural. They resided in a typical little suburban neighborhood. Now, Bob didn't think that there were any forest or woods where they lived. In fact, his father was a pastor, and after hearing about what he saw, he pleaded for the blood of Jesus, and he prayed over him and the house. Now, Bob didn't know if it did anything, but like he said, he never saw this thing after that incident. After he ran out of his room and into his parents' room, telling them what happened, they never checked outside his bedroom. He didn't know if it was because they believed him or what, but they did not dismiss what he saw, only comforted him in his fearful state. Good job, mom and dad. Bob was grateful to have such understanding and believing parents, and he knew most people would immediately write off their child and tell them to return to bed, and it probably helped that he was only 12 years old versus being a little kid, as being 12 years old and telling your parents you saw this versus being like four or five probably gave him a little more substance. In another tale, Jeffrey wanted to reach out because he was curious if somebody out there could hear this and identify the creature that was stalking his trailer at night. 
Now, based on his consumption of related content and some Reddit and internet research, he would suspect that he might have a dogman in his vicinity. But he wanted to make sure it was clear that those who were looking for this thing, that they should not do so. Because if it found them, well, he would consider them unlucky. Now, he never asked for this to happen and wished he had never had any of these encounters. Jeffrey was often awake late into the night. He suffered from chronic pain in his wrists and ankles and was generally a night owl. He lived alone in a small, single-wide trailer. Now, the area in which he resided was fairly open with patches of woods here and there and canals not too far away. His experience with the creature were varied. Before he saw it, he would just hear it banging on his trailer and making noise. Sometimes would sound like it was charging into his trailer, banging as loudly as possible, and would oftentimes leave noticeable dents on the siding of his house as well as claw marks. However, they weren't deep as if the creature wasn't trying to break in, but only leave marks. That's at least how Jeffrey interpreted them. Now, he remembered one particular night when he was doing dishes and looked out his kitchen window to see this thing climbing out of the brush, heading right towards his trailer. It was as if he was watching a horror movie unfold before his eyes. His jaw dropped, his eyes widened in horror, and he remembers slamming the plate he was washing down, breaking it. He runs to lock all the doors, all the windows, turns off his lights, and he hears this thing pay pacing slowly around his trailer for the next 45 or so minutes. It never made a noise, but you could hear it slowly walking around, and then it would go silent for a while and then continue its pacing. After maybe another hour in total, it would stop altogether, and he did not gather the courage to get up and look out the window for about another few hours to even see if it was gone. He was just confined in complete terror for those few hours. And the whole time he sat there unsure of what to do about it, should he call the police? Would they even be able to help him or would they blow him off entirely? Now, this particular incident happened to him around 4 p.m. in the evening, so it was broad daylight. This thing seemed to be much more active at night. And part of him wondered if it was because it couldn't be seen. He kept blinds and curtains all over his windows, not wanting to even risk seeing this thing looking in. And he often worried that this creature was looking for a weak spot to break into his home to get to him. But you think if that was the case, couldn't it just break into the window or break down the door? It's hard to say. The encounters continued for about another year until Jeffrey finally moved out of state for a different job. And yet another man by the name of Stephen claimed that he had encountered what he knew as a demonic Wendigo spirit deep in the wilderness. See, one summer, about six or seven years ago, Stephen had a couple of encounters with what he describes a Wendigo. His first encounter was on an earlier trip in the summer where their destination was into Shore Lake. And it was roughly a six day trip, which had about 60 miles of paddling on one portage, taking your packs and canoes over land to another lake. On day four, they were portaging back out of Sheol through a portage called Dead Man's Portage. Sounds made up from some horror movie story, right? But the portage from the Lake of the Woods into Sheol is called Dead Man's Portage. No idea why they call it that, but it's quite fitting. Now, there was a campsite that is pretty frequently used about half a mile from this particular portage, and they referred to this particular campsite as Dead Man's. Now, Stephen and his trip left Sheol Lake, aiming to get through Dead Man's portage and stay at the campsite right after it. It's a little long, but a nice highway of portage without too many ups and downs. And he believes the Canadian Park Service even cleans out this portage, which may be the only one that is frequently maintained in Lake of the Woods. Now, the short paddle from the portage to the campsite is just surreal, beautiful. The whole entire way, it's through a little inlet with about roughly 10 to 15 foot high cliffs on both sides, covered in moss and gorgeous scenery, beautiful cedars. Stephen in his trip arrived at Dead Man's campsite and later on, just before they were going to bed, they discovered they left their sleeping bag pack at the end of the portage. And at this point, it's right around nine or so, so it was getting pretty dark by this point, and Stephen and a fellow camper set off in a canoe with their headlamps to quickly retrieve the pack. 
Now, the paddle took them about half an hour at this point. You could really only see what your headlamp was shining on. And so they finally get there, they grab the pack, and they start to head back. Now, shortly after leaving, Stephen started to hear loud splashes of things falling in the water trailing behind them. And so he quickly dismisses it at first because beavers are pretty common in the area. And when they slap their tails, it sounds pretty identical to huge rocks being chucked into the water. But the splashes kept going and were right on his back as they kept paddling. And so Stephen looks behind him to see a huge rock the size of a basketball come flying at him and land in the water at his side. And so they began to paddle like crazy, trying to get back to the campsite and away from whatever was chucking these giant, super heavy rocks at them. Stephen looked back between panels and on one of the cliffs, about 15 feet up, he sees two distinct red glowing eyes on it. The rocks stopped coming at them and they were able to make it back the rest of the way. The rest of their trip apparently went along nicely without any other encounters, but he never did feel too great about going through Dead Man's Portage and triple checked that he did not leave any packs there when he did. In July of 2019, an elite group of 20 soldiers from the Mexican military were sent on a covert operation in the state of Guanajuato. Their mission to seek out illegal marijuana plantations in the forests and Sierras and destroy them, but they got more than they bargained for. Now, according to a researcher of the name of Diana Marrera Salazar, on the first night of their deployment, the troops began noticing something unnerving. From their campsite, they could hear eerie wails drifting through the forest. They sounded like someone in anguish, as if they were being horrifically tortured. Now, for most of these soldiers, these sounds reaffirmed everyone's conviction that they were tasked with a very important mission, one that might rescue victims in immediate need. Others, however, were not so sure. They heard something different rising up from the forest that same night. They said it didn't sound like someone in pain. In fact, it didn't sound human at all. It sounded too gruff too guttural, too animalistic. They listened, attempting to triangulate the location of the sounds, but the voices soon ended as abruptly as they had begun. Everyone uneasily settled into their sleeping bags and somehow managed to get a few hours of sleep before rising the following morning. After packing up their camp, they started again on their mission, looking for any sign of the drug producer's illegal operation. Now, only a few hours into the reconnaissance, one member of the group pointed out something odd. The forest was the exact opposite of how it had been last night. While the evening was filled with disturbing screams, the day was uncannily quiet. There was simply nothing to be heard, no animals, noises, bird calls, airplanes, not even wind, ladies and gentlemen. The only noise was the sound of their boots tramping through the underbrush. This unsettling ambience continued all the way until nightfall. The men then made camp, and not long after sunset, the screams started once more. Alarmingly, they seemed to be much closer to camp than before. Although it was standard operating procedure to keep watch in shifts, and the men took this protocol more seriously than ever before, certain that some sort of enemy, human or inhuman, might fall upon them at any moment. But that moment, ladies and gentlemen, never came. As happened the night before, the screams just stopped. Now, the third day, the troops finally found what they had been looking for. They cleared the marijuana plantation, destroyed all the crops, and dismantling their hardware. Their job done, these soldiers began heading to their extraction point, taking a different route to prevent any possible ambushes by the cartels seeking revenge. Now, as luck would have it, this alternate path took them by a cave just as the sun was setting. 
It seemed like a good place as ever to set up camp. I mean, you had the rock walls providing ample protection from several different directions. Tents were then unpacked, sleeping bags rolled out, and security protocols established. Most of the men slept soundly, comforted by knowing that their job was done, and soon enough, they would be back in civilization. For those unfortunate enough to stand guard, however, the hours passed long and uneventfully, that is, until three o'clock in the morning. Once more, the screams began filling the camp just as they had the previous two nights. The soldiers were spooked. No hostages had been found at the plantation. So where were these noises coming from? To their horror, the soldiers standing guard came to a startling realization. The voices, ladies and gentlemen, were coming from deeper within the cavern. In fact, the sounds were so loud, so present, that everybody was now wide awake, listening for the next cry of inhuman anguish. Now, sure enough, the sound came once more closer than ever, echoing across the rocky surfaces within the cave. Their position was now compromised, giving them only two options. Pack up and leave in the dead of night, picking their way slowly through a treacherous forest, or seek out the source of the sounds. The soldiers then split into two factions. You had one group that would remain behind at camp, while the other half would investigate the deeper recesses of the cavern. Weapons in hand, this unlucky crew stepped forward into the darkness. Now, for a long time, the only thing they could see was the splash of illumination from their flashlights on the walls, revealing nothing, barren rock dripping with water. The soldiers would step forward, carefully pushing ahead, keeping an eye out, not only for hostile enemies that they suspected were further inside, but also for more mundane threats like cave-ins and unstable footing beneath. Now, it seemed as if they would find nothing out of the ordinary, or I'm sure that's what they had hoped, until after several minutes of picking their way through the darkness, their flashlights hit something different than the dull gray of the walls. It was shiny, slick, and rubbery. Now, as the lights danced across the object, these soldiers couldn't believe their eyes it was the green, scaly skin of something not normal, and it was lurking in the inky depths. The light revealed further details, each more horrifying than the next. A lizard-like face, claw-like hands, and an imposing height of the size of a fully grown man. Worst of all, ladies and gentlemen, it was not alone. One of the creatures appeared to be female, None of them were stationary. They clambered over the rocks with an agility no human being could muster, ducking out of the light to shield their eyes. Now, despite being hardened by years of military service and very expensive training, the soldiers just stood there in place, completely frozen, not knowing what to do. They weren't trained for this kind of scenario. And as it turned out, the decision would be made for them. Without warning, one of these things let out a scream, releasing the same blood-chilling vocalization that had haunted them the past few evenings. The monstrous cries alerted its companions, who all turned to face the poor group of soldiers. At first, they had no desire to engage these reptilian beings. The men simply ran as fast as they could out of the cavern. But turning and seeing how close their pursuers had drawn, one of the soldiers began to open fire. They all began unloading their weapons on the creatures, which to their amazement, seemed completely unaffected by their rounds. Even when a direct hit was scored, the bullets seemed to ricochet off of them as if their skin was as hard as the walls of the cave. Now, one by one, the reptilians caught up with their prey. A soldier screamed, seized by these things, and then another and another. And by the time the third one was captured, the men had already begun yelling to each other about what they had seen, their friends missing arms splayed out on the floor of the cave, their stomachs ripped apart. Finally, the soldiers tumbled out of the mouth of the cavern. Everyone who waited behind at camp was already on very high alert, having heard the screams and gunfire. 
the survivors began shouting commands, begging their comrades to send radio requests for air support and evacuation in between hurried breaths, describing what had transpired inside the cave. Some of the men in camp busied themselves complying with the orders. Others set up defensive perimeters, ready to defend themselves once these things stepped out into the open. Yet, for the first time all night, the soldiers were granted peace. None of the pursuers dared to exit their subterranean dwelling. The soldiers stood their firearms aimed at the darkness, sweat dripping down their face from a combination of exertion, fear, and the hot Mexican evening. They kept waiting to see their attackers, but they were only met with silence and darkness. Now, the tension of the scene was broken when, not even 10 minutes later, a helicopter appeared overhead. Everybody was relieved, at least at first. They soon realized the helicopter was all black and bore no designations identifying it as part of any Mexican military group. From the chopper came four individuals dressed in metallic black uniforms wearing polarized visors that covered their faces. Now here's where it gets weird. They shouted at the soldiers, commanding them to stand down while they handled the situation. Some of them would later say that their voices sounded peculiar, as if they were heavily filtered or, more bizarrely, were not human at all. Now, after securing the area, the quartet of these bizarre, mysterious rescuers entered the cave, and soon after, the inhuman shrieks they had become so accustomed to welled up once more, accompanied by quick, efficient bursts of gunfire. All fell quiet. The Mexican soldiers waited, unsure of what they should do. At last, the four operatives who had entered the cave reemerged. Two of them were each dragging one of the creature's corpses, while the other two stepped forward to address the commanding officer of the original soldiers. In no uncertain terms, the new soldiers told the commander that they were functioning under the authority of the Mexican government. They also made it abundantly clear that they knew the identities of every soldier in the detachment and that they were under no circumstances to ever share anything about what happened that night during that mission. If they did, well, we know how that would go. They would all end up committing suicide. With that, the four strangers hauled the two reptilian corpses aboard their chopper and took off, leaving the soldiers on the ground completely unable to process what had just occurred. The following day, the detachment made their way back to their extraction point. Boom. Done. Now, according to Deanna Salazar, many of the soldiers involved actually resigned from the military as soon as they were able. Even then, they claimed that they were under strict 24-hour surveillance and only ever shared their account with her under the strictest condition of anonymity. Today, those who remained in military service have been reassigned to new positions, while those who left have taken up positions as private bodyguards. Sure, it's a wild story, but just one among many from people who claim to have encountered reptilian humanoids over the years. Where these beings come from remains a mystery. They might be from deep underground, they might be from outer space, they might be walking among us as shapeshifters, or even sitting across the room from you as you listen to this video. Heck, I might even be a reptilian shapeshifter. But one thing is for certain, stories of their existence are not going away anytime soon. For example, another recent encounter comes from us from California in 2016. On July 10th, a witness, whom we'll call John, encountered something near Los Banos that terrifies him to this very day. Now, the time was around 6 in the evening, and John would later step forward to share his own testimony with the National UFO Reporting Center, or New Fork. He wrote this, This is not a hoax. I am not looking for publicity or any such attention. I am not sure if what I saw was a legitimate sighting, and I am more looking for answers to help me understand if what I saw was an actual alien being. So, my friend, her son and I drove from San Diego to San Francisco for leisure on Friday to Sunday. On our way back, we were driving on the I-5 freeway southbound towards San Diego. We were approximately 10 minutes south of Los Banos. 
windows. The scenery outside was barren. No buildings, structures, or people. Just dry, grassy hills and dirt roads on the sides of the freeway. I was actually trying to get some rest when my friend, the driver, said, What is that? And pointed to the right side of the road. I immediately looked over and saw a tall figure about six feet tall in a thick black monk or death-looking robe with a big hood. Now, this was very unusual to me since it was about 90 degrees outside and in the middle of nowhere. Why would somebody be walking around dressed in a thick, black hooded robe in this heat? John said that he got a good look at this thing's face and what he saw immediately disturbed him. Now, instead of a human face, what lay beneath the hood was something with a prominent snout approximately proportioned like that of a dog's. Above that sat a pair of large black eyes that caught fleeting glimmers from the sun. The entire face was covered in brownish-green scales and stared at him expressionless from about a hundred feet away. Now, despite this distance, John was certain that what he was seeing was accurate and that it was the face of a living creature. It was not a hallucination after all. His friends saw the figure too, nor was it a mask. Whatever it was, John said it chilled him to the bone. In his report of New Fork, he would continue. It wasn't carrying anything or had any equipment with it, and it was walking slow and awkward as if it were looking for something. I was scared to death, especially when it looked right at me. I thought maybe we should pull over and confront this thing, but honestly... I was frozen and we kept driving. I had asked my friend if she had seen what I had seen and her 12-year-old son in the back of the car and they verified the same thing. Again, I just am looking to see if what I saw could be a reptilian and if that is what other people report seeing. I really wish I would have pulled over and went back to get some evidence or a picture, but after reading some articles on reptilians, I feel I made a wise choice. I read that there may be entrances to their habitats in rural areas that may be un seen or hidden from humans. That may indicate that there may be an entrance by Los Banos off the I-5 freeway going south. I am not sure if other vehicles traveling down the road with us witnessed this sighting, but it did happen, and I am willing to swear an oath on it. While anyone can author an anonymous post on the internet, it's worth noting that officials from New Fork reached out to John following his submission. Now, after speaking with him twice on the phone, they said that he identified as a former member of the United States military. He even claimed to have fleeting memories of the further contact in his childhood, although these encounters were much foggier and seemed to indicate interactions with gray aliens rather than anything reptilian. So, is John just simply a liar? Well, New Fork officials said that they were also impressed by his eloquence and apparent sincerity. We suspect that he is a very good witness and highly reliable. Now, another detailed encounter is covered in Artie Six Killer Clark's 2015 book, Sky People, Untold Stories of Alien Encounters in Mesoamerica. Perhaps more than any other researcher, Artie has formed a bond with indigenous North Americans and has been able to gather more stories of their contact with strange beings from far beyond the stars. Now, one of her informants was Chaktuk, a Mayan elder who said that, in his youth, encountered something that can only be described as a reptilian. The year was 1957, and Chalk was only 12 years of age. The evening was quiet and suffocatingly hot. Chalk was asleep in the hammock in the backyard of his family's property when his attention was drawn to the sky. He would tell Artie this. Suddenly, I saw a bright ball of light the size of the moon drop from the night sky and come to rest in the jungle. I called to my father, who was already sleeping, and told him what I had seen. He grabbed his machete. We ran into the cool night in the direction I saw the light come down. No one else saw the strange light reach the ground, but Chalk says that he and several others started to search the landing site. After enlisting the help of his father, two men joined him in his search carrying flashlights. They would press onward into the dense jungles looking for any sign of the bizarre light that the boy had seen. 
The further they went, the stranger things became. I remember that the evening seemed normal enough, but as we walked deeper into the jungle, there was a strange smell. I had never smelled it before, and it made me sick. Sick. Very sick. One of the men with us suggested it was a falling star from the sky. I had seen falling stars before so I knew better. I knew it was not a star, but I had been taught to honor our elders, so I did not speak up. You see, when the stars fall, they have long, fiery tails. This was not a falling star. It was round and as big as the moon. After about an hour of searching and bushwhacking through the jungles, they found nothing. At the very least, they expected to see the remnants of a crash, perhaps an impact crater or similar depression in the ground but there was nothing out of place at all. Chalk, his father, and the two other men were about to give up and head back to their neighborhood when they spotted something. An eerie glow in the trees deeper in the jungle. Now, it took Chalk a moment to comprehend what he was seeing, and after several long seconds, he realized they were not alone. He said this, We moved toward the glow, and that's when we saw, peering above us, a pair of red, burning eyes glowing in the trees. I could have sworn I heard a hissing sound. It scared me, but the others did not hear it. We were familiar with the eyes of animals. We knew the difference. One of the village men had a lantern. He held it high, aiming it in the direction of the red eyes. The creature was frightening. His face resembled a lizard. His skin was green maybe brown. He blended into the jungle very well. If the sun was shining, it would have been difficult to see him. When the light hit him, he jumped from the tree. Although its face looked reptilian, Chalk compared the creature's skin to the scale of a fish. Whatever it was, it was twice the size he was at age 12, perhaps 10 feet tall, and appeared exceptionally strong. He watched it as it leapt from a tree limb three to four times higher than his head and then tumbled on the jungle floor with a loud thud. Chalk said that the ground shook when it landed. Now, the creature didn't wait around for long. Without another sound, it darted off deeper into the forest, or jungle, I should say, in the direction of the glow that was coming from the dark recesses of the jungle. Shock said that while the main experience was over, he dealt with the fallout of his encounter for weeks afterward. He would tell Artie this. It was at that point that we all became very dizzy and sick. The smell I had encountered earlier overwhelmed us. We had no interest in following the creature we had discovered, nor did we have any inclination to search out the glow. We returned home, and the next morning we didn't even talk about the incident. In fact, it was like it never happened. We didn't talk about it. We were afraid if we talked about it, he might reappear. We considered ourselves very lucky. He could have killed us and eaten us by mid-morning. Morning, we were all sick. The sickness lasted for weeks. We developed high fevers and rashes. We were too weak to walk. The village shaman made different medicines. Eventually, we recovered. I have seen lights many times in the jungle during my 75 years, but I have never investigated them. They are a common occurrence here, but I have no interest in following them. One encounter with the red-eyed demon was enough. The behavior noticed by Chalk Took in 1957 seems to happen in other encounters with reptilians, specifically their affinity for climbing trees. Now, as recently as 2017, a witness in the United Kingdom reported this exact same behavior. It was the evening of February 23rd, and the witness was doing mundane chores around his residence in Clacton-on-Sea in Essex. After stepping outside to put his trash in the bin, he heard a noise coming from his garden. It sounded just like someone had fallen from a tree. Now, looking up, the witness spotted someone in the yard staring right back at him. Except it was taller than he was, perhaps seven feet in height, and looked just like a human being, with one frightening exception. It was entirely covered in the same type of skin you would see on a lizard. Suffice to say, he was clearly shocked and was frozen in place until this reptilian being took a step forward. The witness responded by taking a step backward. His movement must have triggered something in this being because it then did something miraculous. Like a chameleon, the reptilian changed colors. However, unlike any natural animal, 
The camouflage was so perfect that it blended into the background entirely, making it seem as if the creature had disappeared. Following this astounding feat, the branches of the tree above where it once stood, the same tree it had presumably fallen from, began shaking violently as if the creature was now cloaked and reclaimed its perch. The witness, now steadily retreating toward the door, squinted at the branches, but could not for the life of him see the creature itself, only the commotion it caused. Now, around a decade earlier, another UK witness observed this same behavior as well. The woman, whom we'll call Margaret, was in Somerset and was out picking blackberries with her dog in the mid to late afternoon. Now, Margaret shared her story with fairy scholar Simon Young, who published it in his fairy census. She said this, One morning, I walked to the corner of my road where there is a green space, an old orchard with oak trees, rowans and hawthorns alongside the cider apple trees. Everything is overhung with brambles and footpaths created by constant dog walking. I was passing a very large oak tree, which had recently lost a dead branch. It had split away and was almost as as big as the tree trunk itself. Clinging to the tree trunk was a creature about the size of a man with a vaguely human face, webbed hands and feet, reptilian looking, and with a damp, frog-like skin of a blue tinge. It looked wary, startled, and almost embarrassed that I had seen it. Now, Margaret claimed that she and the being communicated telepathically. Her first reaction was astonishment at the creature's coloration, which seemed out of the ordinary, not only for a reptile or amphibian, but also for one of the fey folk, which is the way she chose to interpret her encounter. Now, Margaret asked the reptilian, shouldn't you be green? And she got a very terse, matter-of-fact response, no, blue, it croaked in her mind. While most of us might have been too astonished or frightened to do anything but stand there, Margaret was instead moved to compassion. She sensed that the creature was uncomfortable in her presence and simply continued along her way. So if you guys ever find yourselves out there in the thick, dense woods and you encounter, I don't know, maybe a Bigfoot or something that is clearly not from this dimension, just remember you're probably making it uncomfortable, so you should probably remove yourself, which is why it's exposing itself to you. While that was the extent of Margaret's encounter, she has dwelled on it for quite some time since then. She speculated on both the creature's nature and its appearance, saying that what it resembled, more than anything else, was a blue version of the depiction of Gollum from the film adaption of J.R.R. Tolkien's The Lord of the Rings. The match was nearly perfect right down to the eyes. Now, later on, Margaret found another interesting account that seemed to resonate with her own sighting. And she described it to Simon Young, saying this. There was a story of a young boy, disturbed in the night by a frog-like creature crying in distress. A medium was brought in who said this was a tree spirit who had recently lost its tree in a sudden and unexpected way. She successfully sent it into the spirit world where it would wait for a new tree to grow with. I already knew that trees have a consciousness, but the existence of tree spirits who live with a tree until it gradually dies off was something I had not been aware of. If a tree is cut down without warning, it is a terrible shock to its spirit, and there is no preparation for the return to the spirit world. A tree spirit can lose its way in these circumstances and hide in the nearest house. Today, this is what Margaret believes she saw, a tree spirit. In reality, we have no way of knowing. Its disposition was so different, so kind compared to the other reptilians that we have discussed that she just might be correct. Be warned, however, Margaret's peaceful encounter with a tree spirit seems to be an outlier. Time and time again, we find that reptilians are a malevolent force to be reckoned with, capable of phenomenal acts of strength and savage cruelty. Look, if a squadron of trained armed military soldiers couldn't stand a chance against them in the thick Mexican jungles, then what chances do you stand all alone, weaponless, on a darkened road at night? I was on a solo camping trip in the Mendocino National Forest. I had my dog with me, and we were just enjoying the solitude and the beauty of the forest. I had set up camp near a small creek and was just relaxing by the fire 
when I decided to listen to some scary stories on YouTube. I know, not the best idea when you're alone in the woods, but I was in the mood for some chills. As I was listening, I started to feel uneasy. My dog, who was lying next to me, began to growl softly. I tried to brush it off as just my imagination playing tricks on me because of the stories, but I couldn't shake the feeling that something was off. I decided to do a quick Google search about the Mendocino National Forest, and what I found sent chills down my spine. There were multiple reports of people going missing in the forest. What really catches my eyes is another family goes missing in Mendocino. I went through the different websites and news articles of people going missing, but they were all a little hidden underneath national park websites and pictures of trees. I remember looking up the forest about a year ago and didn't see anything and realized that these stories didn't seem to be talked about much, which also piqued my intuition. It was stated that well over 100 people in the past eight years have gone missing and not been found, on top of many which are found dead. It just had my intuition super spiked. I remember just how feeling unsafe I felt, how much I wanted to get out of there, and it just terrifies me. I feel so uneasy about what I was hearing and to this day, it still bothers me. My dog and I are very close, and she was a stray that started following me one day, and I ended up bringing her home from Costa Rica. So her little growls along the way make me feel like there was something wrong, even though it was just a storytelling video. Those stories originate from somewhere. I have done a lot of solo traveling, both in and out of the country, and I have never had such a bad feeling. On top of seeing an unnecessary amount of dead animals in a national forest, which just seems strange. I don't think I'll be doing anything more like solo traveling again unless it's around civilization. Now, if you're at all familiar with the popular lore and legends of Native America, then you've probably heard of the infamous and mysterious creature often referred to as the Wendigo. Now, these bizarre and menacing beasts are renowned for their monstrous abilities, and they've been major characters in tribal folklore for quite some time, specifically up north. Now, as settlers made their homes in these lands, tales sprung up of terrifying encounters with these particular monstrosities, often resulting in missing settlers blamed on these savage creatures. Even in this modern era, strange encounters with these things have continued to be reported time and time again. First, let's get a good idea of what a Wendigo actually is. Emerging from the myths of the Algonquin tribes lurking among the northern forest of Nova Scotia, east coast of Canada, and the Great Lakes region, the Wendigo is indeed a genuinely nightmare-inducing entity. Typically portrayed as an enormous beast with a height reaching of up to 15 feet and a terrifying blend of human and animal features, the Wendigo is synonymous with insatiable greed, ruthless murder, and cannibalism. Visual descriptions often present the Wendigo as an outrageously tall, skeletal figure with blazing eyes, lengthy yellow fangs, monstrous claws, and a long tongue, often accompanied by antlers. Or so the creepypasta variation shows this. However, there are countless eyewitness descriptions that have a completely different physical makeup. And as you'll see here in the more stories I'm sharing with you in this episode, you will see a variety in how people describe this thing. We recently moved into a new house out in the country. The house is more than twice the size of our house in the city. It's all updated and has no neighbors within a mile. It's a radical change from the life we lived in the city. But best of all, it was less than half of what we were paying for our old house. The house was a foreclosure, and when we asked the listing agent about it, she simply said the old family had abandoned the property. We really didn't think anything about it since those kinds of things happen all the time in apartment complexes when people don't have the ability to pay rent anymore. The first three months were pretty uneventful, with us settling into our new life, the kids getting used to the new school and new friends, and most of all us getting used to the big house and property. But then the weather turned cold, and things started to get weird. It started with noises from the back property, 
things we chalked up to being in the woods. Then the motion lights around the house started going off randomly, and once again we just chalked it up to being in the woods. But last night, that all changed. Last night was the most terrifying night of my life. One of the dogs was at the back door, whining and scratching. I assumed he needed to go to the bathroom, so I grabbed my flashlight and walked out the back door. Instantly, something felt off. The dog bolted for the back property, growling and snarling. It was a cold night, about 30 degrees, but the dog plunged straight into the creek and out the other bank, running off into the woods in the back of the property. Flashlight bouncing, I ran after him calling his name. I got to the creek and made my way across the makeshift bridge, trying desperately to follow him. I could hear the dog still growling and barking from somewhere up ahead, and I pushed further away from the safety of the house and deeper into the woods, and that's when I heard it. A shriek like I've never heard before in my life. It was a mix of a moaning wail and metal on metal. It echoed through the trees and froze me in my tracks. My dog bounded its way back to me and cowered behind me. I turned around and could just make out the warm glow of the house behind me. In the cold dark ahead of me, I swung my flashlight around, looking for the source of the noise. That's when I heard an even more terrifying noise. Out of the cold silence, my wife's voice floated all around me. Babe, the voice called out. I whipped back around, and I could just barely make out the image of my wife safely inside our house. The voice called out again, Babe, I'm right here, came the voice from deeper into the woods. Then came another voice, just as clear as the other, and it was my dad's voice. Come out here, it called. I swung the flashlight around again, and this time caught the briefest glint of light bouncing off eyes. The creature was in the beam of light for barely a second, but it was tall, maybe six feet, and ashen white. It had long, spindly fingers that grasped the trunk of a pine tree, and then it was gone. I turned back and ran towards the house. I ran headlong into the icy creek and stumbled. My dog ran past me, making it back to the yard and up the porch. I dug my hands into the freezing, muddy bank and pulled myself out, not stopping to even look back. When I reached the porch, I scrambled inside. My wife frantically ran over to me, asking what happened. I just shook my head, uncertain myself what had happened. I had a growing sense of dread tonight as the sun began to fall. We kept the dogs inside, and I haven't dared to look out the back. But as I sit here typing, one by one, the motion lights in the backyard keep going off. Richard Weiner spent much of his life working in the western part of the northern Atlantic. Well, I like the name The Devil's Triangle better because Bermuda Triangle sounds too much like a honeymoon with a mother-in-law or ex-boyfriend. Now, over the years, he had several occupations and working in this section of the ocean, the infamous Bermuda Triangle had afforded him the opportunity to see and experience many peculiar things. However, ladies and gentlemen, one of the most bizarre events would happen to him in 1969. Now, in his words, it was something that had me mystified for a number of years to come. That year, Richard was performing oceanographic work for General Electric. Now, his work had required him to dive 14 miles south of Bermuda, where he was to conduct underwater filming on buoys. For this task, Richard set off from the dock with fellow diver Pat Boatwright, who remained alongside him as a spotter while they dove beneath the waves. Now, the ocean was incredibly deep at this particular location, as deep as 4,000 feet. In his 1974 book, The Devil's Triangle, Richard recalls what happened that day in vivid detail. I had just finished filming the movement of an instrumentation buoy in rough seas. The last of my film had run through the camera when my safety diver, Pat Boatwright, grabbed me by the shoulder and pointed downward. It was late in the afternoon. 
and the rough seas were distorting the light that penetrated into the depths. What I saw was phenomenal. How deep it was, or its size I couldn't tell. It might have been 100 feet beneath us, maybe 150 feet. Its size I could only guess at, maybe 100 feet across, possibly 75, but no less than 50 feet in diameter. It was perfectly round. Its color was a deep purple. It was moving slowly up toward us. At its outer perimeter, there was a form of pulsation, but there was no movement of water. As we started for the surface, it stopped its ascent. Then slowly, it began to descend into the blackening depths. Awe-stricken, we watched until it was no more. For a number of years, I was unable to determine what it was that Pat and I had seen. He theorized that it was a giant squid, but I found myself unable to agree with him. Most of the people that we mentioned it to said we'd been underwater too long that day. In fact, they almost convinced me that they were right. Richard puzzled over this interaction, which lasted for around five minutes for years. It wasn't until some time later that Richard stumbled upon what he thought was the most likely answer. He was half a world away from Bermuda, speaking with locals at the Majuro Pier in the Marshall Islands when he saw something that sparked his memory. Richard wrote this. All around the dock, from a depth of two feet up to the surface of the lagoon, was swarming with medusa-shaped creatures, averaging about six inches in diameter. As I stood pondering what a painful death it would be, were one to fall into the water among those venomous creatures, I suddenly realized that their movements were identical to that of the huge thing that I saw rise up from and return to the depths off Bermuda. Could we have seen a monstrous jellyfish? Who can really say what creatures the sea shelters. Now, Richard Weiner isn't the only person, nor even the first, to claim an encounter with what they can only be described as a colossal jellyfish. I mean, could such creatures actually lurk beneath the surface of the ocean rarely seen? I mean, we already know that massive jellyfish do exist, if not at the dimensions reported by eyewitnesses like Richard Weiner. The largest officially recognized species of jellyfish is the lion's mane jellyfish, and their size is very dependent upon where they are found. In lower latitudes, their top portion, known as the bell, rarely exceeds 20 inches. But the farther north you go, however, they can reach a whopping 6 feet 7 inches across. In fact, the largest specimen ever recorded measured 120 feet from the bell to the end of the tentacles. Now, each tentacle contains a deadly neurotoxin whose effects range from a simple rash to affecting respiration. Now, luckily, human beings rarely cross paths with lion's mane jellyfish since, you know, they dwell out in the open ocean and all. But because of this, spotting one is a rare treat. While the lion's mane jellyfish is certainly large, it is still smaller than what Richard Weiner saw off the coast of Bermuda. I mean, even if we take his most conservative estimate, he spotted a creature that was 50 feet across, making it nearly eight times larger than the biggest lion's mane ever recorded. You know, we know of other encounters around the time of Richard's sighting. One year before his experience in Bermuda, divers from a Chilean hydrographic expedition in the South Pacific supposedly saw something massive hovering in the water near an abyssal trench. They said it kind of resembled a jellyfish. One of the earliest encounters with these massive cryptids occurred in 1953, although its documentation is much poorer than Richard Weiner's sighting. But according to an Eric Frank Russell in his 1967 book, Great World Mysteries, a diver in the South Pacific saw something similar. Now, Russell obtained the report from a Russian newspaper. It was 1953, and the witness, an Australian man named either Christopher Loeb or Christopher Lupa, was testing out a new deep sea diving suit. 
Christopher said this, All the way down, I was followed by a 15-foot shark which circled around full of curiosity but made no attempt to attack. I kept wondering how far down he would go. He was still hanging around some 30 feet from me and about 20 feet higher when I reached a ledge below which was a great black chasm of enormous depth. It being dangerous to venture farther, I stood looking into the chasm while the shark waited for my next move. Suddenly, the water became distinctly colder. While the temperature continued to drop with surprising rapidity, I saw a black mass rising from the darkness of the chasm. It floated upwards very slowly. As at last light reached it, I could see that it was of dull brown color and tremendous size, a flat, ragged-edged thing about one acre in extent. It pulsated sluggishly, and I knew that it was alive despite its lack of visible limbs or eyes. Still pulsating, this frightful vision floated past my level, by which time the coldness had become most intense. The shark now hung completely motionless, paralyzed either by cold or or fear. While I watched fascinated, the enormous brown thing reached the shark, contacting him with its upper surface. The shark gave a convulsive shiver and was drawn unresisting into the substance of the monster. I stood perfectly still, not daring to move, while the brown thing sank back into the chasm as slowly as it had emerged. Darkness swallowed it, and the water started to regain some warmth. God knows what this thing was, but I had no doubt that it had been born of the primeval slime countless fathoms below. Christopher's description vaguely conforms to a lion's mane jellyfish, which is brownish in coloration and does sport ragged edges. However, they rarely prey upon sharks like this, and even if they did, a 15-foot shark would be too large to succumb to their tentacles. Plus, Christopher described what he saw as measuring a full acre, which, if existed, would easily make it the biggest oceanic life form on Earth by surface area alone. Was Christopher exaggerating? I mean, even if the jellyfish he saw was a more reasonable size, something with a bell a dozen feet or so in diameter, its size still blows the lion's mane jellyfish out of the water. Pardon the pun. Another diver claimed to have seen an immense jellyfish himself, although his report comes from a different part of the world and didn't resurface until the early internet era. The witness shared his sightings with a friend who posted about his experiences anonymously through an online news group. Author Chad Armand eventually reached out to this user and discovered that the witness's name was George Hale and that he had passed away in 1994. Now, according to his friend, George saw a number of bizarre life forms while working as an underwater welder for oil rigs in the Gulf of Mexico, specifically in the 1970s. Chad was able to learn the following from George's friend. He was unable to describe the predator in detail. It was too big and too close to him. It was as big to him as you are to an ant. As a matter of fact, he had to ascend pretty darn quick because he was in fear of being crushed like a bug. But the predator had a pallor and skin texture like a sea anemone, and it might have been built along the lines of a starfish or a freshwater pond hydra, and it was eating the fire hose entity by swallowing it. Its method of propulsion is a mystery. You may have noticed the reference to a fire hose entity. This was another creature George claimed to have spotted at the time. Now, if true, his testimony suggests an entire undiscovered aquatic ecosystem that we know nothing about. George's friend told Chad Arment this. He was seeing things down there that were beyond his ability to comprehend and even describe, and he wasn't the only one. At one oil rig, the welding crew were getting used to seeing this giant, headless, glowing living fire hose that would zoom in from out of nowhere at incredible NASCAR speeds and would keep on zooming past the welders for up to 15 minutes. As in every cryptozoology story, we are faced with a harsh reality. Stories are fine and all, but where's the proof? The limitations of filming or photographing underwater in the 1970s, even though it was certainly commonplace, might answer that question a little. Even still, we would expect more evidence today in the form of images or videos or, better yet, a specimen. Has a giant jellyfish carcass ever been recovered? One may have, 
although it was unfortunately and conveniently lost, if the story is indeed accurate. Now, according to Adam Benedict of the cryptozoology website known as the Pine Barrens Institute, an Australian vessel named the Coranda collided with a large unknown creature in the South Pacific off the coast of Fiji in 1973. Now, as the story goes, the Coranda was traveling through a storm when the bow of the ship was entirely engulfed by the bell of a gigantic jellyfish. Its tentacles lashed around the sides, making contact with one crew member who died. The ship's captain, a gentleman by the name of Langley Smith, said that the creature measured more than 200 feet long. And when the bow struck the bell, the creature erupted, sending a gooey mess all over the deck. The jellyfish's gelatinous insides stood two feet high in some places. According to the tale, a tugboat christened the Hercules, it was radioed, and helped remove the remains of the jellyfish from the Curanda using a high-pressure hose to clean up the deck. Now, supposedly, samples were later analyzed at a lab in Sydney, Australia, and revealed the creature as an oversized lion's mane jellyfish specimen. Now, the story doesn't end here, however. It gets much more convoluted the deeper you go. Catherine Shaw of the Strange Animals podcast did some digging, or should I say diving, and discovered that the Coranda story may not be exactly what it seems. You see, Catherine traced the tale back to an old article from Fate magazine, which in turn listed the source as James Sweeney's 1977 book, Sea Monsters. Now, after obtaining a copy herself, Catherine found the story as described, but was perplexed. There seemed to be lots of easily verifiable details, but none could be found in any newspaper archives. At last, she traced the account to the colonial secretary's file of the archives at the State Library in Melbourne, Australia. With the assistance of a helpful librarian, Catherine learned that there was not one, but two ships named on the Coranda on file. The first was actually broken up in 1936, while the second wrecked in 1969. There was no record of the ship ever existing in 1973, nor was there any indication that anyone by the name of Langley Smith was the captain. So Catherine has no idea about where James Sweeney heard the story. Maybe it's through word of mouth, who knows? She does point out that he also mentioned a similar story, one with a better pedigree. She cites an article from the July 2nd, 1874 issue of Dublin, Ireland's The Freeman's Journal. The entry states this. The master of the screw steamer Strath Owen, on his way to Madras, observed a little schooner lying becalmed, and between him and her, what he at first thought to be a bank of weed. The mass was perfectly quiet, but after a time began to move towards the schooner. Suddenly it struck her and sunk her to the bottom. The master of the Strathowen put about, dropped boats, and saved five men from the sunken ship. James Floyd, the master, was rescued, and he tells his story in the most circumstantial fashion. The Pearl Schooner, 150 tons, was bound from the Mauritius to Rangoon. On the 10th of May, about 5 in the evening, he observed a great mass rising slowly out of the sea. It remained stationary and looked like the back of a huge whale. In a hapless moment, he took his rifle and hit the monster, which began to lash about furiously. All the men were then ordered up, and knives and hatchets and cutlasses were grasped, and all awaited the advent of the terrible stranger. We could now see a huge oblong mass moving by jerks just under the surface of the water, and an enormous train following. The oblong body was at least half the size of our vessel in length, and just as thick. The wake or train might have been 100 feet long. In the time that I have taken to write this, the brute struck us, and the ship quivered under the thud. In another moment, monstrous arms like trees seized the 
vessel and she heeled over. In another second, the monster was aboard, squeezed in between the two masts, the brute holding on by his arms, slipped his vast body overboard, and pulled the vessel down with him on her beam ends. The general opinion amongst the sailors is that the big bank of seaweed was an octopus, but we dare say a little confirmation of the story would be welcomed by us all, whether naturalists or not. Now, before continuing, Catherine Shaw should be applauded for her diligent work on the topic. The level of research is very impressive. Unfortunately, the story of the sinking of the Pearl Schooner led to another series of dead ends. No further record of her sinking, no record of a ship named the Strath Owen, nor any indication that Captain James Floyd ever existed. It doesn't mean the story is fictional, but it does introduce a seed of doubt. Now, returning to the Coranda story, was this 1874 entry the inspiration for the 73 encounter? Did the story somehow get passed down over the years, transforming the giant octopus into a giant jellyfish? Or was James Sweeney simply just making things up? Either way, we know that the article from the Freeman's Journal exists, and if it is accurate, the story still points to gigantic tentacled monsters lurking in our deepest oceans. While the Coranda tale might be fictional, another more recent event involving a ship and a giant jellyfish might have a little more merit. In his book, Real Monsters, Gruesome Critters, and Beast from the Dark Side, the late paranormal author Brad Steiger reported that a 10 ton fishing trawler capsized back in 2009. Steiger reported that on November 2nd, the Diasan Shinsu Maru sank off the eastern coast of Japan, the result of an encounter with a gigantic jellyfish. The crew was trying to haul their catch aboard when the weight in the net caused the ship to tip over and capsized. Everyone wound up in the sea and, well, the ship sank. But as in the case of the Coranda, all is not as it seems with this story. It is true that a ship named the Diasan Shinso Maru was capsized in 2009. Yes, that is true, and it indeed met its fate at the hands, or tentacles rather, of jellyfish. But it wasn't a giant jellyfish. It was numerous giant jellyfish. Now, according to newspaper reports at the time of the incident, the net of the Diasan Shinsu Maru was filled with a massive amount of Nomura's jellyfish. This particular species, while not as lengthy as the lion's mane jellyfish, still possesses a bell of equal size and can even weigh up to 440 pounds each. Now, in recent years, the jellyfish population in the Sea of Japan has exploded. The reason for the population bloom is simply blamed on climate change. Many fishermen report pulling up far more jellyfish than usual, and this was what happened in the case of the Diasen Shinsumaru. According to the Coast Guard, all three crew members were rescued after the vessel had capsized. However, folks, the crew of the Diasen Shinsumaru is not alone. In just 2007, 15,500 reports of damage all blamed on the Nomura's jellyfish were recorded. Some suspect that the same conditions that have allowed jellyfish populations to bloom might also be affecting the size of individual specimens as well. I mean, it's possible, right? Could this be the root cause for encounters with jellyfish of colossal size? Whatever the case may be, sightings do continue. In fact, in 2005, an encounter in the water off Thailand allegedly caused someone's death. A French scuba diver by the name of Henri Astor told newspaper that he and his companion had spotted an immense, strange brown mass attacking a school of fish. The fish were instantly paralyzed and killed when they made contact with the creature's tentacles. Now, this bizarre sight had caused Henri's diving companion to take off in pursuit of the creature. He was supposedly never seen again. Another fatal encounter took place in Japan, where in 2009, the Diasan Shinsumaru incident occurred. Here, 
ladies and gentlemen, fishermen tell rumors of regularly catching jellyfish larger than human beings. On one occasion, a young Japanese man called the local police department in tears. He swore that while swimming with his family, they had seen a jellyfish the size of a vehicle. His entire family was captured and killed by the monster. Law enforcement officers, of course, didn't believe it, but because of his claim, they would actually jail the man for suspected murder. However, he was eventually released after successfully passing a polygraph test. With the possibility of such horrendous man-eating creatures in the ocean, you might be forgiven for wanting to stay on land, regardless of whether or not giant jellyfish are real. You might think that you're safer waiting on the beach when all your friends go rushing into the waves. but. You'd be wrong, guys, because giant jellyfish aren't just seen in the ocean. They're also seen in all places, like up in the sky. And as a matter of fact, guys, one of the first documented cases of a gigantic aerial jellyfish occurred on September 20th, 1977 in Russia. It was seen by hundreds of people as it glided through the air with all the grace of its oceanic cousins. The sighting sent the population into a panic, prompting more than a thousand letters to Soviet authorities, and supposedly, all of this correspondence was destroyed by officials who had a zero tolerance policy toward the paranormal. The newspaper report of the incident read this, an intensely radiant star which looked like a shining jellyfish stood above Petrovazods. It moved slowly towards Petrovazods, throwing rays of light on the city. There were thousands of beams, and it looked like heavy rain. A little later, the beaming came to an end. The source of light changed its brightness and moved towards Onyiska Lake. On the horizon were gray clouds, and when the object went into these, a number of semicircles and circles of pink light appeared. The manifestation lasted 10 to 12 minutes. This was not the last time a giant flying jellyfish would be seen. More recently, four military radar stations in China's Hebei province noted an anomalous reading on October 19, 1998 above a military flight training school. Now, this corroborated by 140 witnesses on the ground who, as in Russia 21 years earlier, were able to photograph the object. After ruling out both civilian and military aircraft, base commander Colonel Lee ordered jet fighters to intercept the intruder. While observers on the ground described the object as resembling a star that grew in size, the pilots said that a closer inspection would reveal the truder as something resembling a mushroom or jellyfish. Its bottom half decked out in lights that dangled underneath. In fact, the official report said this. The object clearly resembled depictions they had seen in foreign science fiction films. When they got within 13,200 feet of the UFO, it abruptly shot upward, easily evading subsequent attempts to get closer. It appeared to be toying with the fighter by repeatedly outdistancing it and then reappearing right above it. All requests to open fire on the flying jellyfish were denied. Instead, the pilot was instructed to pursue it and reached a height of nearly 40,000 feet before running low on fuel. The pursuit was broken and the jellyfish, whatever you want to call it, vanished before additional aircraft could be scrambled. 17 years later, another massive object resembling a gigantic jellyfish was seen swimming through the clouds, not the ocean, you probably thought I was going to say the water, but the clouds above Gronian in the Netherlands. Again, the witness, Harry Purton, was able to take a photograph of the subject, which clearly shows something out of the ordinary. It was June 1st, 2015. Harry had stepped outside following a storm with the intention of taking pictures of the sky, which to his eye looked especially beautiful. Now, that was when he first noticed something out of the ordinary. He claimed he was taking photos and something suddenly flashed. And at first he thought it must have been his camera and he realized though the flash wasn't from his camera. And so he's thinking, well, gee, that's odd, but he just simply dismissed it as a lightning strike or something. And so it wasn't until much later when he would actually develop and look at the images that he noticed a bizarre shape had been captured on camera. 
And one of the most recent flying jellyfish sightings comes to us from Toronto. A Rochelle Gallant of the Canadian tour organization, The Haunted Walk, reported that on April 12th, 2012, a witness spotted something odd in the clear sky. Apparently, this thing came down from above the clouds, slowly descending for about a minute before the eyewitness began filming. They would even later post this to their YouTube, although it would then get taken down for unknown reasons. Now, screenshots of the recording can still be found online, and it does seem to show exactly what the witness described, which is a jellyfish-like creature floating through the sky, but while it doesn't seem very large, it appears in front of a skyscraper, giving us some sense of scale. Its existence, if proven genuine, would suggest that our atmosphere holds strange life forms we have yet to discover. Now, it's worth noting that the witness, while skeptical at first, kept noticing details they simply could not explain. And they asked whether or not what they were seeing was some sort of plastic bag, but this possibility doesn't make any sense. They even added that of simply a bit of airborne debris, how can the eyeballs and tentacles be explained? I mean, did it just simply land and hop away? Who knows, it is quite odd. Rochelle Gallant thinks that some giant flying jellyfish sightings can be explained by a natural phenomenon that occurs in the aftermath of a rocket launch. She wrote this, a space jellyfish, also known sometimes as a jellyfish UFO or rocket jellyfish, is a phenomenon caused by sunlight reflecting off the gases that are emitted when a rocket launches during the early morning or evening twilight hours. This means that whoever is lucky enough to catch a glimpse of a UFO jelly is in darkness on the Earth, while the exhaust plumes that form the jellyfish are in direct sunlight. It's how the space jelly gets its distinct appearance. The twilight effect is the scientific name for this phenomenon. Space experts used it to explain why the SpaceX Falcon 9 launch on December 22nd, 2017 coincided with an abundance of UFO reports. However, Rochelle acknowledges some problems with the twilight effect explanation. It cannot account for the jellyfish seen in the sky above Toronto on April 12th, 2012. The apparition is simply too small and appears in between the witness and a building. Not something one would expect from a rocket launch. It also occurred in broad daylight, whereas the name would imply the twilight effect tends to happen in the evening or the morning. Now, most interestingly, she was only able to find one rocket launch on the date in question. And that occurred, folks, in North Korea, very far away from Canada. Even if this was the answer for what was seen in Toronto, one damning fact remains. The Korean rocket launch failed. And so we are left, as always, with a conundrum. We know for a fact that the ocean holds jellyfish, some of which can grow quite large. I mean, it doesn't take too much imagination to conceive a colossal jellyfish dwelling somewhere beneath the waves, far from the eyes of human beings. Yet, we have no evidence of this, no photographs, no videos, and no bodies. We do, however, have quite a bit of evidence for gigantic jellyfish in the sky, a place where the creatures don't exist at all. It simply defies all reason and logic. So I ask you, the viewer, what do you guys think of this? Now, in a very chilling account shared by a Reddit user named Universe Master on Graham, who identifies as Native American, delves into a mysterious encounter that took place near an unnamed reservation during a camping trip when he was just 13. The trip started off as any other, but soon a series of disturbing events began to transpire, turning their adventure, ladies and gentlemen, into a nightmare. The campsite was littered with the lifeless bodies of birds, a very strange sight to behold, and you can't really ignore that. Items from their camp began disappearing without a trace, leaving them baffled and on edge. But things would continue to get worse, and they would hear footsteps around their campsite, and a foul, nauseating odor would occasionally permeate the air, adding already to the horrific atmosphere. The constant, unnerving sensation of being watched was ever-present, making it impossible to shake off the feeling that there was something horribly wrong. 
But despite all the occurrences, they decided to just stick it out, given they had been planning this trip for months and they were not about to give up that easily. However, on the day of their trip, something bizarre happened. More bizarre than what was already happening, the witness recounted a very strange thing. Now, although these occurrences were a disturbance, they did not deter them from staying for the final two days as they had been planning for months. However, one experience years ago on the day right before their departure, they had been strolling through the forest while looking for firewood when they heard rustling in the bushes. Now, as this happened, it seemed that all life ceased around them because they could only hear their heartbeat and the lone heavy footsteps approaching them. Then they heard their name called from what seemed every direction, yet echoed from in front of them while also coming from behind. The voice they recall was very harsh and raspy, almost like an animalistic imitation of their sister's voice who had just recently left the trip due to stress only hours prior. Now this completely shut them down. They ran as fast as they possibly could back to their campsite while they heard the twigs and leaves crunching behind them. Once they had reached their campsite is when the footsteps suddenly stopped and they were relieved and slumped over to their cabin stairs when they slipped on a rock, slipping out of the makeshift fire, and then they described something almost supernatural in nature. As they're going back and they're relieved and they slump over to the cabin, one of them slips on a rock and nearly falls right into the makeshift fire. Now, almost right before they fall in, something stops them mid-fall, causing them to regain their balance. It was just as if somebody was hanging on to them and then pulled them back. And they're not sure what to make of it, but their family suggested that it was a guardian spirit saving them from an early death. But after that experience, they never went to the same campsite ever again and did not go camping for a few years after that. Still, what really scared them the most from back then was that when they had been leaving the campsite, they looked back from the car window and saw a figure standing at the tree line staring at them, and their descriptions of it were different than the stories I already told you. They described it as lanky and looking starved to the point of having its skin wrapping tightly against bones. But when they looked onto the pathway, the footprints were completely gone, and as they blinked, they rounded the corner and it seemingly vanished into thin air. This left them trying to comprehend what had just happened. Was it reality? Did they have some sort of mass hallucination? Either way, they were completely freaked out. And so their sister began asking them why they were so shaken. So they explained to her what they experienced and her face too went pale. And she had explained to them that before leaving, this horrific gaunt figure had been watching them across the riverbank and that it had noticed her and what she described was ran away on all fours at a fictional speed. She shakily said to them, I'm the sort of person who is skeptical of any claims regarding the existence of the supernatural. My wife claims to see ghosts and dead people and that she's an empath. I'll concede that she's a very good guesser regarding other people's emotions and the history of places and families, but I can't accept her statements as fact because they're not empirically provable. With that said, you can believe me or not, but what I'm about to say is something that even I have a lot of trouble disbelieving. I can't say I've had any paranormal experiences in my life, but there are several things that happened when I was quite young that I simply can't explain. By the time I was about 12 to 18 months old, I had either a memory or a very vivid imagination of my life before birth. I was floating up in the sky, standing on thin air. There was no land in any direction. In front of me was a kindly, middle-aged Native American man wearing a plain white robe. He asked me if I was ready. Some kind of vision flashed before my eyes, and I said yes. I somehow descended and experienced my own birth. Keep in mind that this is before I was able to comprehend what birth was, so I didn't even know about Native Americans yet. When I was about six or seven, I started getting very distinct mental images of something extremely disturbing. What I saw was a tanned, mummified-looking, emaciated dead face. The eyes were glassy but somehow horribly alive, 
and the lips and nose were shrunken. The creepiest thing about the face was the too wide smile and a full set of very white teeth. When I was nine or ten, I read for the first time about some expedition or other in the Antarctic where several ill-fated members of an expedition or a group died and were left behind. Their bodies were recovered in the 20th century in the article I was reading, and images of them. I had never seen a frozen body before, but as soon as I saw those pictures, I immediately correlated what I was reading with the thing I'd seen earlier in life. From that point onward, I started having almost real, waking visions, in a way that's hard to explain. More than just in my mind's eye, and yet not exactly as if it were actually in front of me, of something that is basically my worst nightmare. It was an eight to nine foot tall, and I know this because its head almost touched the ceiling, frozen corpse, completely naked with long arms and legs. It was the same face I'd seen before in my mind, with shrunken features. Only now, I had a full body that was just as emaciated and mummified as the head and neck were. I only saw it on cloudy days in late fall or winter, and always when it was between me and a window, so it was sort of backlit. It never made any motion to do anything, it just stared down at me with a horrible grin. In high school, I got on Wikipedia at some point and finally learned what the thing was. The Wendigo. For those who don't know, it's a mythical spirit creature. I was born in Connecticut and have about 1% Native American blood in me from about 400 plus years ago. My first traceable ancestors in America came over shortly after the Mayflower, and one of them married a Native American woman. Now, do you see the part why I'm so creeped out now? According to the legend, the Wendigo was an evil spirit associated with starvation, the winter, and cannibalism. It either lured desperate people into eating their fellow humans during the winter, or possessed those who did resort to cannibalism. There are various stories about how it looked, but most of them agree that it looks like a frozen corpse, generally taller than a human. And no, it doesn't have antlers like in all modern depictions you'll find via Google. It reportedly can ride on the wind, mimicking voices to lure the unwary into ambushes and has a heart made of ice. But here's the thing though, I experienced this before I ever identified what the creature was or knew about the legends. Only after almost a decade of intermittently seeing the Wendigo did I come across this description. This description is from Wikipedia and follows. The Wendigo was gaunt to the point of emaciation, its desiccated skin pulled tightly over its bones, with its bones pushing out against its skin, its complexion the ash gray of death, and its eyes pushed back deep into their sockets, the Wendigo looked like a gaunt skeleton recently disinterred from the grave. What lips it had were tattered and bloody. Unclean and suffering from separations of the flesh, the Wendigo gave off a strange and eerie odor of decay, decomposition, decay, and death. I've done further research, and all of this information I found from various sources all concur with what I saw. So, I'm remotely linked to the Native Americans with whom the legend originated. I have always had a deathly fear of dead bodies, especially mummified looking ones, and I saw a creature from their stories long before I learned that what I saw matched the traditional descriptions perfectly. Our next chilling account comes from a Reddit user by the name of Cat. Now, this person doesn't reveal the exact location, but does confirm that it's a place where Wendigos have apparently been sighted before. Apparently, there's been multiple brutally mutilated animals all scattered around this person's secluded property. And they describe finding foxes and deer in horrifying states, their spinal columns ripped out and scattered about. 
The animals bore the marks of savage claws and teeth, their limbs torn from their bodies in a gruesome display. Now, in some instances, these poor creatures were gutted, their entrails grotesquely draped over bushes or trees, reminiscent of some twisted, nightmarish Christmas decorations. In other cases, the animals were simply ripped in two with one half mysteriously missing. Now, this is already extremely disturbing, but as little did Cat know, the encounter with the unknown was about to escalate into something far, far worse. So let's set the scene. The house is situated roughly 100 yards from a small stream that bisects a small wooded area. On the far side of the stream from the house, large trees stand tall. One day, while out there, a sudden chill and discomfort had washed over Cat, and it felt as if they were being watched. And so they began getting extremely paranoid, having the constant feeling that someone or something was out there with you. Deciding it was best for them to head in, especially with dusk approaching and light waning, they began walking back towards the house, which by the way was uphill. And so at first, the pace was steady, not too fast, with a sense of purpose, but like walking off someone's yard after being told to leave. Then the feeling of being watched in danger intensified. Turning around, they spotted what they describe as a large creature about 80 yards away, roughly, standing across the stream. This entity or creature or being took a step towards them, and they weren't particularly athletic, but not weak either. A 20-yard uphill run through the woods would typically take them 30 to 40 seconds, but of course you throw in fear and adrenaline, and you can count that down to about 10 seconds. It was by far the most terrified they had ever been, the most adrenaline they had ever felt. Now you might wonder if dehydration or hallucinations could have played any part in all of this, but they had never had an hallucination before, and they were not dehydrated. Just 10 minutes prior to this encounter, they claimed that they had consumed an entire bottle of water, always ensuring hydration before exploring. And it couldn't have been a tree because every time they go out there, they would have to go where they would see it. And there wasn't a single tree small enough to even remotely resemble what they had seen. Now, since then, Cat has not seen this entity again, but believes that the Native Americans believe that this was a Wendigo as it is able to mimic human cries to try and lure people towards it. Cat even goes on to describe that oftentimes they will hear what sounds like a little girl calling for help in the woods or a baby crying. And every now and then, Cat will also hear the voice or the mimicked voice of deceased loved ones beckoning her to come out to the woods. They're not really sure what to make of it, but they firmly believe it is in fact a Wendigo. Coming from the Lone Star state of Texas, we have another chilling account from a witness who swears that this event unfolded in the heart of Texas Hill Country during the sweltering summer. Now, I don't know about you guys, but if anyone out there watching this knows how hot Texas gets in the summer, whew, there's something as hot, but then there's Texas hot. All right, so the witness at this point was spending some time at his parents' place, which was a home shared with a multitude of feline companions nestled alongside a tranquil creek. Now, on this particular evening, one of the cats, which was a loyal companion who they named Topaz, pretty name for a cat, who typically accompanied this individual around on strolls on the property. And at this point in time, this cat was right by his side. However, there was nothing ordinary about this evening. This witness recounts some very bizarre events that transpired next. You see, there was a creek on the property as well. And while usually there, the eyewitness was never ever having issues while down there, but this one time had proven to be strange. Now, Topaz the cat was unwilling to cross into her usual spot, and the witness noted it was eerily quiet. It was noticed a little later that Topaz was acting as if something was threatening her, and just acting strange. You know how cats can be. And so the eyewitness looks up and claims to see this strange creature with long arms and very tall, but there was no recollection of anything like talons or claws, antlers or any matted fur or anything, but did remember very dark, large eyes, oriented forward like a predator's would be. And the strangest thing about the entire situation was that this eyewitness was entirely overcome with fear and dread, almost to the point of vomiting. The observer quickly grabs the cat, runs back to the house, and avoided the creek for ages after that, though 
oddly, they felt quite certain that whatever that thing was, for whatever reason, wasn't able to cross running water. And so about a month later, they felt like it was safe enough to go back, and so they did. Now, as far as they knew, there was no family history on either side for hallucinations or mental health, and even if there were, this would have been their only experience with one their entire life, and it's been almost a full decade since this happened. Mostly, they were wondering if anything of this particular demonic description had been ever encountered in Texas before. And lastly, ladies and gentlemen, this chilling encounter hails from the untamed wilderness of Georgia's northern mountain ranges. The individual sharing this is a supposed seasoned outdoorsman who frequently embarks on camping and hiking adventures with his brother, Ryan. Now, on this occasion, they had set their sights on a very familiar location nestled halfway along the Jacks River Trail in the Cahuta Wilderness. Now, their plan was to spend two nights in the heart of nature, away from the busyness of all day life. And they found a nice secluded spot, set up camp, and spent the day exploring around Jacks River. Now, as the sun began to set and they started their fire and began to cook dinner and settle in for the night, just with the camaraderie together under the stars, things began to change for the worse. They described hearing a very disturbing noise. And so both brothers, well-versed in the symphony of the forest, found this sound to be very out of place. It was as if multiple individuals were stealthily moving around their campsite, trying to remain undetected. But what happened after that catapulted their experience from mildly unsettling to downright horrifying. They both pull out flashlights and they're shining them in the direction that they can hear the sounds coming from. But what was even stranger is that whenever they would fix their lights on a spot they thought the sound was coming from, the location of the sound would suddenly change. And that is when the whistling started in. Now, at first it was thought to be the wind and maybe the thought crossed their minds that maybe the wind was just throwing leaves around and what they were hearing was really nothing more than the wilderness and that they were overly spooked. And so Ryan looks at his brother and asked if he was hearing that too. Now, of course, the brother didn't answer because he was too focused on each individual sound and trying to find out what it was and there were two consecutive notes with roughly a three to four second gap, and then two more consecutive notes over and over and over again. And so Ryan kept asking if he heard that, and his brother kept putting his finger to his lips, trying to keep him from talking. Now at this point, their anxiety and fear is just continuing to climb and to rise, and their jaws are clenching, their fists are tight, they are terrified, and at this point, they are not ready for whatever it was that's out there. The whistling would continue for what felt like forever, but thinking it through it was maybe five minutes or so at most, when Ryan, who's finally had enough, shouts out into the darkness, hey, quiet dead, nothing, everything stops. The whistling stops. They sit there in silence for a few short moments when the woods begin to erupt with noise. Something was running in a circle, very large, mind you, around their campsite. And the whistling comes back. Two consecutive notes, again, with the same three to four second gap, and then two more consecutive notes comes back. How could someone whistle this loudly without cracking while also running? At this point, they were done. They stood up, shining their lights in all directions, trying to just catch a darn glimpse of whatever this was screwing with them. Nothing. It felt close enough to touch, but they couldn't see anything. And that's when the movement stopped but the whistling was still constant. It was so loud, inhumanly loud. Ryan's brother looked at him and told him, we gotta call the police now, this is getting bad. Now this right here is the worst part. The part that they do not like to talk about. I'm getting chills as I'm telling you this. While Ryan is on the phone with the dispatcher, telling them their location and what exactly is going on, his brother steps around the fire towards the tent and inside, folks, his bag, he had a six inch fixed blade that he had always carried with him and assumed he would feel a bit more comfortable with it in his hand more than his flashlight. And as he goes to unzip his tent, trying to keep his eyes towards the woods, he hears some movement directly in front of him. So he quickly sweeps his light in front of him and for maybe two seconds, 
he saw it. Now he describes it as it because it wasn't a person. It was a thing, probably about five feet up in a tree. Everything about it he described was long. Its arms, its legs, its neck, its fingers, everything. And it was fast. And as soon as the light hit it, it launched backwards off of the tree. He then heard it land, but it either jumped an impossible distance or landed in a thicket because he said he heard it, but he never saw it. He doesn't think he has ever yelled so loud. He runs back to where Ryan was and sat down. Ryan kept asking him what he saw, but he's just in so much shock he couldn't think to answer. He just kept thinking about what it was he saw. And so as he's trying to process this and Ryan's still on the phone and they're trying to calm each other down, maybe 10 minutes had passed and they see a couple of flashlight beams coming through the woods and these three guys come into view asking if everything is okay. Immediately they begin to feel better and they start to settle down. And so these guys are trying to find out what's going on. They're making sure that Ryan and his brother are okay. And so Ryan and his brother tell these guys that they heard a lot of movement. They're not sure what's going on. They describe the whistling, the strange noises. They don't know what is following them. Now, one of the guys had actually walked around and came back and said he didn't see anything at all. And Ryan told them that they called the police and roughly 30 minutes afterwards, a park ranger shows up. Now, Ryan and his brother tried explaining everything to him, but of course, he just chalked it up to either a curious animal or maybe some campers trying to mess with them. So we really only have two conclusions. Either he hallucinated or he made it up, right? It's fake. Or he really did come into contact with something of the paranormal realm. But I'll let you guys decide that one. One early winter's morning in 1965, a band traveling home from a gig in Woodstock, New York, had their journey suddenly interrupted by car trouble. Well, this is a tale many of us regular folks can relate to. The circumstances surrounding this incident are noteworthy. The van was carrying one of the most influential musicians of the 20th century, visionary guitarist Jimi Hendrix. With Jimmy were several other members of the band, including Curtis Knight. Now, years later, Curtis would share the details of when disaster struck. It was four o'clock in the morning and we were trying to make it back to Manhattan, a drive of more than 100 miles through the worst blizzard I can recall, he would later explain. Now, these driving conditions were treacherous enough and that was when things would take a turn for the worse. The car was swept into a snowdrift and then stalled. Jimmy, Curtis, and other musicians watched as the driver kept trying to leave, but the wheels only spun in the snow. They were stuck. They sat there helpless as the minutes ticked on by, the temperature dropping steadily, despite the fact that the heater was running full blast. And as the heater ran, everyone in the band began to feel drowsy. Only years later, with the benefit of hindsight, would they realize that the van might have been filling with carbon monoxide. It was a very dangerous situation. At any moment, anyone might pass out and be claimed by the gas or the cold, both of which kept steadily creeping in. But that was when something miraculous happened. According to Curtis, the snow on the road slowly began to glow, glow brighter, and it became apparent that something was descending out of the whirlwind of the blizzard, a tall pointed structure shaped almost like a cone. The object finally came to rest on the road, no more than a hundred feet away. Whatever stupor the cold and the carbon monoxide had placed them in vanished as the entire band, including Jimi Hendrix, noticed this strange sight. Now the panic was short lived as what happened next unfolded in mere moments. From somewhere on the side of the craft, a panel slid open, a tall figure effortlessly glided from the landed shape, heading in the direction of the van, melting the snow on the ground as it floated. Now, only seconds later, it was standing on the right-hand side of the vehicle, gazing through the window directly at Jimi Hendrix. The musician and the monster stared at each other. Curtis Knight said that Jimmy seemed to be communicating telepathically with it, whatever it was. 
Now, as the two held each other's gaze, the other band members noticed something astonishing. The interior of the vehicle rapidly began to warm, allowing them to turn down the heater. Now, at the same time, the snowdrift that the van had become mired in melted away, freeing the tires and allowing them to gain traction on the newly cleared road. Then, just as quickly as the being appeared, it retreats back toward the tall cone in the snow and disappears within. The side hatch slid shut, and the object began a forceful, steady ascent into the sky, just like a rocket on a launch pad, slipping free of all gravity. Everyone in the band was stunned, or as I can imagine in the 60s with everyone doped up on drugs, whoa, dude, that's pretty killer, man. <laughs> Maybe not though, they were probably sober. No one said a word as they continued their journey home and only years later did Curtis Knight remember the incident. He claimed that the entire band acted as though they had been hypnotized. Jimmy had an interesting reaction though when Curtis brought the event up later in conversation. And Curtis said, Jimmy never did talk about what happened. He sort of let me know that the cool thing was not to bring up the subject. It was to be our little secret. In private, Jimi Hendrix appears to have been a bit more forthcoming about his experiences. He claimed numerous encounters with UFOs and eventually shared what he had come to believe with his girlfriend, Monica Donovan, who was a figure skater and painter from Germany and would be the only person with Jimmy in the hours preceding his death in 1970. She said this, Jimmy was convinced that in the near future, galacticians from outer space, from another galaxy of great positive power, would come to our planet to help mankind in its struggle with evil. While explaining this, he drew two points representing this higher power coming closer and closer towards our galaxy, the Milky Way, finally reaching Earth. He told me that the arrival of the extraterrestrials would bring about a great change on our planet, and that love, peace, and brotherhood among the peoples of the earth would start to blossom again, just as they did in the ancient civilization of Atlantis. Now, one question from Curtis Knight's story still lingers. What did this being look like? Now, according to Curtis Knight, Jimi Hendrix got the best look of anyone in the band. He said that Jimmy compared it to kind of like a cross between a feathered creature, maybe like Mothman and an angel. Anyone interested in the paranormal should have their ears perk up at the mention of Mothman. Could this infamous being sometimes connected to extraterrestrials, sometimes connected to cryptids, have actually appeared to have one of rock and roll's iconic figures? Well, if so, we have to ask whether it was Jimi Hendrix who made that comparison or Curtis Knight, who drew that distinction years after the sighting. You see, the name Mothman wouldn't be used to describe a large winged humanoid until nearly a year later at the very least. So the term Mothman first emerged during the creature sighting in Point Pleasant, West Virginia, which I'm sure many of you are already well familiar with, which unfolded between 1966 and 1967. Now, following a sighting from two couples on November 15th, 1966, the entire town, even the entire region of West Virginia was swept into a mania featuring not only the Mothman itself, but a whole host of accompanying high strangeness, including, but not limited, to odd lights in the sky, UFO sightings, strange visitors comparable to the men in black, and poltergeist phenomena. Now, the aspect of these sightings that received the most coverage in the press, however, was the Mothman himself, named after the second-rate Batman villain killer, Moth. The entity was famous for, well, really two things its large, intense, red glowing eyes, and its massive wingspan, which allowed it to pace cars traveling as fast as 62 miles per hour. Dang. Now, some sightings described it having a head, while others suggested that its head was held low or that it lacked a head entirely, its eyes set into its wide shoulders. Now, events in Point Pleasant culminated on December 15th, 1967, when 46 people were killed after the Silver Bridge connecting Ohio to West Virginia collapsed into the icy waters of the Ohio River. A fracture only three millimeters deep caused the entire structure to come crumbling down, making it the deadliest 
bridge accident in the United States history. While there is no direct evidence that Mothman was to blame, the timing of the incident, coupled with numerous warnings about an impending disaster chronicled by researcher John Keel in his 1975 book, The Mothman Prophecies, would cement Mothman's reputation as a sort of harbinger of doom, predicting mass death in the aftermath of its appearance. Now, it is true that, at least sometimes, tragedy befalls Mothman witnesses, as with the infamous Silver Bridge incident. However, it is often difficult, if not impossible, to prove that the creature has anything to do with these disasters. In fact, one example where Mothman brought bad luck to those who saw it comes to us from the writer and researcher Nick Redfern. According to Nick, an elderly couple approached him in 2001 to share a very unsettling encounter that would unfold in early 1946 in Littlefield, Texas. Now, the couple told Nick that the incident took place at a property that sat on the edge of town. There stood a large old house owned by two elderly sisters who had a reputation for being reclusive and eccentric. Over the years, the sisters' house earned a frightening reputation among kids in the neighborhood. They would often tease and dare each other into prowling about the property, often in the dead of night. Well, late one evening, a group of young thrill seekers decided to patrol the building themselves. We can all see where this is going. Tensions ran high as they crept around the house, shh, unsure of what lay just beyond the next corner, and as they rounded the bend outside, they saw something more horrific than they expected. A pair of massive creatures emerging from the cellar door. What are we in an X-Files episode here, guys? Both of them acted stealthily as they wished their presence to go unnoticed. When they stood, the children said that the beings were immense, each towering over the witnesses around eight feet tall beyond what this camera lens could even show and sported a pair of enormous leathery wings. Not feathery, leathery. These, like their bodies, were covered in gray, disgusting skin, which provided a sharp contrast to their eyes, which glowed blood red. Now, once the creatures came out of the cellar and stretched, they spun around in the direction of the kids. Everyone froze in terror, some screaming, as the beings then took off across the property, half hopping, half running. After gaining enough momentum, both monsters unfurled their wings and took off into the night sky. Now, several of the witnesses added a very odd detail. Well, according to Nick Redfern, they said that the limbs of the creatures looked almost hollow against the background of the full moon that loomed overhead. After the creature's departure, the kids decided it was time to leave the property ASAP. And as they fled, two of them looked back to the house. They claimed that from one of the upper windows, both sisters were glaring down into the yard grinning maniacally. The fact that they weren't surprised, to the contrary, they seemed pleased. It suggested that they somehow had a connection to the two abominations that had emerged from the cellar. Perhaps they were witches that had summoned these demons to do their bidding. It's hard to say. The aftermath of this sighting would unfold over the next several months when a motorist in the area eventually saw something resembling the kid's description of the creatures standing in the middle of the road and sadly moaning. However, that isn't the most unsettling thing to happen in Littlefield, Texas after the 1946 Mothman sighting. Now again, according to Nick Redfern, the old couple who shared this story with him claimed that all the witnesses to a person had died at surprisingly young ages from a variety of seemingly unlikely accidents. While the Littlefield sightings took place two decades before the collapse of the Silver Bridge, well, it seems to hint at what can only be described as the Mothman Curse, an idea that did not take root until the publication of John Keel's research in 1975. Now, both cryptozoologist and ufologist debate how strong this curse is if it exists at all. Now, many point to the fact that countless documented Mothman sightings are only ever followed by a little bad luck and nothing more. Still, more witnesses report nothing out of the ordinary at all afterward, 
Certainly nothing as tragic as death and destruction. Now, much of the lore surrounding the Mothman curse is a product of Keel's writing, which doubled down on the idea to a varying degree of believability. Now, as evidence, he cited the deaths of several major players in the Point Pleasant sightings, as well as the deaths of prominent ufologists all within 10 years of the Silver Bridge collapse. Also, it's kind of worth noting using the same criteria, we could easily lump Jimi Hendrix's death into the list of Mothman victims. He was dead within five years of his sighting at the tragically young age of 27, but his death is a whole other video worth of content, so I'll save that for later. Now, more convincingly, through a series of mysterious phone calls and channeled communications, John Keel claimed to have learned about John F. Kennedy's assassination during his time in Point Pleasant, but was unable to reach the president in time. Now, he also claimed to have learned that Martin Luther King Jr. would be assassinated assassinated in Memphis on February 4th, 1968, and even tried desperately to reach the civil rights leader on the phone. Keel failed in the effort, but was relieved to be proven wrong when February 4 came and went without any incident. Then, two months later to the day, King was taken out on April 4th, 1968. Now, more recently, the Mothman curse seems to manifest in more unpredictable ways. In January of 2004, the husband of Kimberly Frazier's stepdaughter passed away following a horrific car accident near Olive Hill, Kentucky. Just six months earlier, Kimberly claimed to have seen a large winged shape soaring through the summer sky in the exact same location that her stepdaughter's husband died. Several manifestations of the Mothman curse have made headlines in the past few decades. Well, none were Mothman witnesses themselves, they were still associated with the entity as filmmakers. A November 2006 article for the MUFON Journal, noted cryptozoologist Lauren Coleman wrote this. Lisa McIntosh, who is the associate producer of the documentary Mothman, Man, Myth, or Monster, died on July 5th, 2006 of a rare cancer called multiple myeloma. Now, the executive producer, Barry Conrad, explains that, strangely enough, she began having fainting spells while in Point Pleasant, West Virginia, during our visit in September 2004. Now, she was only 42 years of age. Doctors said it was a textbook case, extremely unusual that this type of cancer would affect someone as young as she was. Now, only one out of approximately 200,000 people contract this disease. The mystery death of people associated with Mothman films and investigations is a topic that I have documented for some time. July has not been a kind month for those who have experienced these strangely Mothman-related deaths. On June 30th, 2004, a Jennifer Barrett Pellington, 42, wife of the Mothman Prophecies director Mark Pellington, died after a never-identified brief illness in Los Angeles. Now, she was involved in costume design and even received a thank you credit on the Mothman Prophecies. On July 16th, 2005, Mark Chorvinsky, 51, editor of Strange Magazine of Rockville, Maryland, died after his relatively quiet battle with cancer. Three investigations of Chorvinsky's overlapped with Mothman prophecies, including his interviews with people who cited what Chorvinsky called the Potomac Mothman. Another catastrophe often associated with Mothman is the April 26th, 1986 Chernobyl nuclear incident. Both in terms of lives lost and cost, it remains the world's worst nuclear power plant disaster. Only after spending the equivalent of more than, I think it was like $68 billion, was the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics able to get the situation under control. One of the atomic reactors at the Chernobyl atomic power plant in the city of Kiev was damaged. Similar puzzling reports of high radiation came in from all over Scandinavia. A radioactive cloud headed north across Poland today and into Denmark, where radiation levels were five times normal. For many, it was too late. Both first responders and people in the vicinity of the power plant would suffer from radiation-induced cancers for years and years to come. Even for those who did not suffer physically, the impact was significant. Tens of thousands of residents were forced to evacuate and abandon their homes. 
In the decades since the meltdown, stories have emerged claiming that just days prior to its failure, the plant was visited by an enormous black bird with a 20-foot wingspan. Reports supposedly came from technicians in the control room and other personnel surveying the grounds outside on foot. Now, one of these stories described something large and black swooping through the skies above Chernobyl. It seemed to have the torso of a man, but completely lacked a head. Its red eyes appeared to be placed near the shoulders, as in some Point Pleasant accounts. Now, those who witnessed this visitor reported it to their co-workers, who confirmed that they too had seen or heard about this creature, which carried it with the nickname, the Blackbird of Chernobyl. Now, from that point forward, workers at the plant reported being harassed by mysterious phone calls and suffering from terrifying nightmares. Rumors suggest that the sightings of the Black Bird of Chernobyl would continue until literal moments before the disaster. Reports of Mothman putting in an appearance just prior to the Chernobyl meltdown are tantalizing, but most researchers agree that these stories have also been exaggerated. It's a little bit too much to get into here, but they mostly believe that the Chernobyl Mothman stories arose by accident following a confusingly written afterword added to the 1991 reissue of John Keel's The Mothman Prophecies. Now, both Lauren Coleman and Nick Redfern assert that none of the Chernobyl Mothman tales can be traced back to their primary sources with really any degree of reliability or credibility for that matter. The Chernobyl stories may or may not be authentic, Better evidence exists connecting Mothman to another nuclear disaster, one that happened just over a decade ago. If true, some of the creature's sightings in 2011 can be directly linked to one of the most profound catastrophes in recent memory. In March of that year, Japan was hit with a magnitude 9 earthquake. In addition to sending the ground rolling beneath their feet, residents of the Tohoku region had to contend with a tsunami battering the coastline. Because the earthquake, the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant was significantly damaged. And over the coming days, the world watched in horror as the plant entered a nuclear meltdown whose effects are still felt a dozen years later. The surrounding environment, community, and flora and fauna were all poisoned to varying degrees. What Lurks contributor and author of The Unexplained, Brent Swanser, ladies and gentlemen, lives in Japan and was among the first to collect reports of something that, in hindsight, might have predicted the Fukushima disaster. When hearing these accounts, a startling possibility emerges that Mothman may have visited Japan just prior to the earthquake. Now, among the witnesses that Brent cites is an American businessman, Marcus Pules, who claimed to have been on a work trip to Japan in February of 2011. Marcus was staying with an old friend in Okuma, just three miles away from the Fukushima nuclear power plant. One evening, Marcus and his host were walking the shore near the station when they heard something strange. It was a rushing or whooshing sound. Now, at first, both of them thought it was just the waves crashing against the boulders that scattered the coast. Their assessment changed when the sound repeated itself and was accompanied by a horrendous shriek <coughs> unlike anything they had ever heard. Marcus described the noises as shaking him down to the bone and making the hairs on the back of his neck stand on end. A couple walking nearby out for a romantic walk along the coast also reacted to the shriek, ensuring him that it wasn't just a figment of his imagination. Of course, the couple pointed towards the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant looming in the distance and there roosted on top of one of the buildings and silhouetted against the moonlight and the floodlights was a large figure and it was dark and as they watched it stretched a pair of enormous appendages long broad and wing-like on either side it flapped these several times before taking flight where it circled above the nuclear power plant several times 
Now, according to Brent, Marcus's descriptions of the flight patterns went as follows. The creature then took flight and circled the plant at least four to five times. Some circuits he took at a fast pace, some he seemed to slow down. All the while, he kept his attention on the row of square-shaped buildings that I later found out housed the reactors. The creature then came toward us, flying at least 25 to 30 feet off the ground. A younger couple who had noticed the creature first were now screaming and cowering, the man shielding the woman while shielding his head with a jacket. My friend and I looked in awe as this creature flew over us. That's when I noticed the two large red eyes. They seemed to glow from within and with a blood red hue. They were unblinking in the three to four seconds we saw them. We knew they were looking straight at us. We knew this creature knew we could see it, and it made no attempt to disguise itself. The sick, intense, and overwhelming feeling of dread came over us. A feeling that we shouldn't be there was, to say the least, overwhelming. Marcus's friend tried to pull out his phone and snap a picture of the beast, but it was too late. The winged creature was simply too far in the distance, heading toward town. Because of the time of day, all the pictures turned out too dark. Now, both Marcus and his friend dashed home, discussing what they had seen, a conversation they would continue well into that night. Had it just been a trick of the light? Could it have been a gigantic bird? All these explanations felt hollow. They knew what they had seen and it was unnatural. Now, the following month, Marcus was back home in the United States when he flicked on the television and saw news that the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant, the very place where he and his friend had just seen the creature, had been damaged. A sickening feeling arose in his gut. Could the creature have caused this disaster or at least been trying to warn people of an imminent catastrophe. Marcus would say this, the Fukushima Daiichi was the exact same plant we had seen the strange bird-like creature circling. Was it pure coincidence, or was it the mythical Mothman doing his strange work of predicting disasters? I may never know, and may go to the grave wondering that, but one thing is certain for sure. I don't think that neither of us is going to forget this event, no matter how long we live. As compelling as Marcus story is, it gains additional credibility from another testimony offered by an unrelated witness. Brent Swanser also told the tale of a man he called Hiroshi, who preferred to remain anonymous. On March 10th, 2011, just a day before the earthquake hit, Hiroshi was in the Fukushima area on a business trip, and like Marcus, he and a friend had decided to take an evening stroll in the vicinity of the nuclear power plant when they noticed something out of the ordinary. Now, their first reaction was that a bird was flying overhead. Even this didn't seem quite right. The creature seemed to have a wingspan somewhere between 10 and 15 feet across. Hiroshi and his friend watched whatever it was soar over a bluff and just above some nearby treetops. An uneasy sense that was no bird crept into Hiroshi's mind. No birds in Japan were that big. Both he and his companion watched it continue its trajectory in the direction of the Fukushima plant, its movements completely silent. Now, Brett spoke to Hiroshi, who told him the following. Whatever this thing was, suddenly rose up really high into the air and circled a few times before coming down to one of the buildings at the nuclear facility and landing right on top of it. We could then see that it was not a bird. It was standing there and it was very humanoid in shape, its wings now folded up over its back. It was dusk and some distance away, so we could not see it in very great detail, but it was definitely humanoid, with two arms and and two noticeable legs. We could see no facial features, but the head seemed oversized. The creature stood very still there on that roof and seemed to be looking out over the ocean, its head moving as if it was scanning the horizon. It remained there for a few minutes and then leapt off the edge of the building and shot up into the sky, where it once again circled and then flew off out of sight. And the next morning, Hiroshi headed home to Tokyo, where he learned about the Fukushima meltdown. Now, you tell me, guys, what are the odds that two witnesses completely independent would have such similar stories to share? 
I mean, sure, it's possible, but why does Mothman seem to appear just before a tragedy? Is it evil or is it good? Is this simply a cause of misfortune or simply trying to warn us? Now, one thing is for certain. If you should see something human-shaped flying through the sky, be on high alert. It doesn't just pose a danger to you in the present, it may well threaten your future. And since you guys made it this far into the video, I want you to all comment down below, I done seen a Mothman. So that way I know who's made it this far into the video. And if you guys enjoy content just like this, be sure to go ahead and smack that like and subscribe button for more videos by yours truly. And as always guys, I love you all, keep an open mind, and I'll see you all in the very next video.